This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 240 of the program. Today is Friday, May 8th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support the show this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving to us. And that includes Bethany Cook, Eric Dolendel Vashio, Gato Love, Inas El Saban, Ivan Leon Skivik, Joshua Landeros, Juan Sandoval, Kathy Lee, Keith Inholtz 2, Kevin Chavez, Manchovel, Nurse Hemp, Radio Ardia, Renee Caver, The Midwest Princess, Theodore Pulver, Wanda Meadows, William Brunt, and Vanna Gonzalez. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. We've got a jam-packed episode for you this week. We'll talk about MSNBC finally asking Joe Biden about the Tara Reid allegations, followed by the response from centrists and spinning from other propagandists like Joy Reid. We'll address the anti-quarantine protests that took place, how Alex Jones is already wanting to resort to cannibalism. I'll remind you about who George W. Bush is and we'll close the show by talking to Savage Joy and also I will talk to 2020 Green Party presidential contender Howie Hawkins about his campaign. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's show plus some additional segments. Hopefully you will enjoy it. Let's go ahead and waste no time. Get right to it. After more than a month of media silence, Joe Biden was finally asked about Tara Reid's allegations in an interview on national television. As you all know, Mika Brzezinski asked him about this on MSNBC, and I think that, you know, judging by the response to this interview and the response of the general population now knowing about these allegations, now that they have more details and facts, it's evident that nothing is going to come of this because the Democratic Party's base, they don't really seem to care. Now, I didn't necessarily expect anything to come of this, but I mean, there will be no political consequences for Joe Biden at this time at all. Certainly, I think that Republicans are going to try to weaponize this against him in November. But in terms of the Democrats and their base seeking accountability for Joe Biden, they just don't seem to really care. They don't actually believe survivors, contrary to what they said, as little as two years ago, when they wanted all of us to believe Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and the allegations that she brought forward against Brett Kavanaugh. I believed her, and I believe Tara Reid, but not as many people are that consistent. Now, predictably, Joe Biden denied these allegations, and I will say that I do think Mika Brzezinski did an admirable job, but I'm not going to give her too much credit because when you wait more than a month to even mention it, there's an issue there. There's a media bias problem that we have to address as a society going forward. But with, with that being said, uh, here's what he had to say about this allegation. But Mr. Vice President, as it pertained to Dr. Ford, everyone wanted uh, high level Democrats said she should be believed that they believed it happened. You said if someone like Dr. Ford were to come out, the essence of what she is saying has to be believed has to be real. No. Why? And no, what I said, it has Why to be. Why is it real for Dr. Ford, but not for Tara Reid? There, because the facts are that, look, she, I'm not suggesting she had no right to come forward. And I never, and I'm not saying any woman, they should come forward. They should be heard. And then it should be investigated. It should be investigated. And if there's anything that makes it, that is consistent with what's being said, and she makes the case or the case is made, then it should be believed. But ultimately, the truth matters. The truth matters. It's period. I fought my entire life to change, to change the whole notion of the law and the cultural sexual, around the culture on sexual assault. 
and I fought to strengthen and protect mm -hmm. the process for survivors. I believe that we've come a long way, and we have a long way to go in this system before we, in fact, are in a position that there's a fair and unbiased view. But at the end of the day, it has to be looked at. These claims are not true. There's no cooperation. I mean, they're not true. Mr. Vice President, I don't know what else I can uh, say to you. Are you absolutely certain? Are you absolutely positive there is no record of any complaint by Tara Reid against you? I am absolutely positive that no one that I'm aware of ever has been made aware of any complaint, a formal complaint made by or a complaint by Tara Reid against me at the time this allegedly happened 27 years ago or until the, I announced for pre well, it was, I guess it was in April or May of this year. I know of no one who's aware that any complaint was made. So predictably, he unequivocally denied this accusation. And if I were Joe Biden, if I'm innocent and I know that this didn't happen, I would unseal the document that would lead to her complaint. Because if there's a complaint that's there and she doesn't allege that she was sexually assaulted and only sexually harassed, as she says, the complaint says, you can kind of use that as evidence in your own favor to at least, at a minimum, downplay these allegations. Now, oftentimes, sexual assault survivors, they change their story. They disclose a little bit of information and then they, you know, reveal more as time goes on, as they become more comfortable talking about this. But regardless, you know, if you want people to know these details, if you want a proper investigation to be conducted, you unseal these documents and you just allow, you know, a very narrow investigation into these records so people can see the complaint that she had filed, right? Because she said she did file one. It's going to be there. So the question is, why wouldn't he do this? Why won't he unseal this document so we can see it? And the answer is, uh, well, he doesn't have an answer. And I'm just talking about her name, not anybody else in those records. A search for that. Uh, Nothing classified with you... the president or anybody else. I'm just asking why not do a search for Tara Reid's name in the University of Delaware records? Well, Mika, because I'm trying to pretend like she doesn't exist and that I never knew her and I want to move on from this as quickly as possible. Yeah, see, he was speechless there because he doesn't have a good answer. There's no good answer for this. If you're innocent, you want the most thorough investigation imaginable to be conducted because you know that more information is going to be better for you. It's going to strengthen the case. But he's not doing that. He's not doing that. Now, prior to him actually talking about this directly in an interview with Mika Brzezinski, Chris Hayes actually covered this in a really brief segment, and the backlash to him even mentioning Tara Reid's allegations was huge. But before we talk about, you know, the aftermath, this is the segment that he put out just a day or two before Joe Biden actually addressed these allegations head on. There have been moments, I think for many of us, for all of us, when we have heard about accusations against someone that we find ourselves desperately wanting not to believe whether that is because we have some personal admiration for the individual or their work or political admiration, someone on our quote unquote side. But part of the difficult lesson of the Me Too era is not that every accusation is true and everything should be believed on its face, but that you do have to fight yourself when you feel that impulse. You have to do that in order to take seriously what is being alleged and what the evidence is and to evaluate it. And that is the case with the accusation by a woman named Tara Reid against Joe Biden. Now, at first, when I saw Chris Hayes do this segment, I was genuinely surprised. I was taken aback. I didn't expect this. And I thought, wow, credit where it's due. He's being responsible. He's trying to be objective and he's doing his job. But then I reminded myself, you know, how low the bar has gotten and that we shouldn't applaud a journalist for finally doing his job after more than a month of silence. I mean, if you go back the first time when we talked about this on The Humanist Report, it was at the end of March. So, you know, I can't give him too much credit for being this late on an issue and basically tap dancing around these allegations and adding a hundred different caveats about he how he doesn't really want to believe this because he supports Joe Biden and what have you. But still, even though he covered it a month too late, 
immediately after that segment aired, hashtag Fire Chris Hayes immediately started trending on Twitter. And, you know, even though I didn't really see too many uh, people directly calling for Chris Hayes to be fired, I saw mostly people saying that the prospect of him being fired for talking about this is stupid. Just the fact that anyone believes that a pundit should be fired for doing what should be their job it really tells you a lot about the state of American politics and American political discourse. It is so toxic because here is, you know, an outlet who was, I think, rightfully holding Brett Kavanaugh accountable. And now the minute they try to hold someone on their own team accountable, you see the backlash from their audience, which consists mostly of Democratic Party loyalists. And you're seeing that this is basically a cult. This is a group of people who are not interested in ideology or policy. This is a team sport to them. And so long as they can get their team across the finish line, that is all that they care about. Now, the backlash to this became so overwhelming that Chris Hayes actually had to address this in the following segment in the next episode that he did. Um, and I think that he he gets a little bit of credit for you know remaining courageous enough to not back down. But you can see here... He's kind of doing a little bit more lopsided coverage in this segment because he brings up the inconsistencies with Tara Reid's claim, but he doesn't actually talk about how we have new evidence that corroborates what she says, which is why we're all talking about it now, which is why, you know, the media is all of a sudden covering this because you can't not given the new information that we have, like the Larry King clip, right? Her neighbor's account. So this is the follow-up segment that he did. We covered this story earlier this week, a few days ago. Joe Biden had not addressed these allegations today. As you saw, he did. It was his first time directly responding to them on the record. A lot of people were unhappy with the fact that we even covered the story, which is why you may have seen the hashtag Fire Chris Hayes trending on Twitter most of the day yesterday. Needless to say, I received a lot of feedback about the segment we did, which basically fell into three categories. The first category were people who basically said, I don't believe Tara Reid. Tara Reid, I believe Joe Biden based on their assessment of the actual verifiable facts of the story, such that we have them. And they pointed out, as we did when we covered this the other day, that her story has changed quite considerably. A year ago, she told a California newspaper that in 1993, Joe Biden touched her several times, making her feel uncomfortable. And then back in March, she made a much more serious allegation, claiming that in 1993, then Senator Biden sexually assaulted her, penetrating her with his fingers under her skirt. Biden denies that accusation, as you saw, uh, specifically responded to today. Tara Reid also claims that she complained to three other people who worked in Biden's Senate office at the time when she was there about harassment, not assault. And then all three Biden staffers who've been contacted by reporters, they all say no such complaint was made. Biden's then executive assistant was vehement in her denial, quote, I never once witnessed or heard of or received any reports of inappropriate conduct, period, not from Ms. Reid, not from anyone. I have absolutely no knowledge or memory of Ms. Reid's accounting of events, which would have left a searing impression on me as a woman professional and as a manager. So the people that fall into category one say that the weight of those three people, those three staffers, plus Joe Biden, long record in public life, against what Tara Reid says about what happened at the time, leads them to conclude that she is not telling the truth. Now, the second set of responses I got was from people who fall into the I don't care category. Some of that even use the phrase, We're in the midst of a national nightmare, the worst disaster in generations, and we just need to get rid of Donald Trump. Now, that is not the way that I think about analyzing this particular story, but it's an honest expression of how some people view the trade-offs and the stakes here. And then the third category, which I got a lot of, was the one that was the most disquieting to me, which is a whole lot of people pointing to various aspects of Reid's character or her writings or her politics as a kind of proof that she's not credible, that she's making it up. Oh, she didn't report this sooner or she said nice things about Joe Biden, her former voice boss at one point, so how could he have assaulted her? Or she supported candidate Bernie Sanders, so clearly this was just a political hit job. Or she said things that people find strange on social media, and on and on, much of it adding up to, you just can't trust this woman. Now, these are the kinds of things that have been used forever against women making these types of allegations. And to me, the lesson of the Me Too movement is not that you believe every single allegation. Of course not. No, the lesson is to take accusations seriously to swiftly investigate the facts surrounding them as best as one can, while leaving aside the worst age-old instincts to drag the women who make those claims through the mud. So good on him. I have no problem with him bringing up the inconsistencies in the story with regard to Tara Reid. 
But you do have to be fair. If you truly are trying to be objective and get to the bottom of this, you mentioned the Larry King clip, right? You bring up her neighbor's accounts and how she was told about this in the mid-90s. And she believes Tara Reid, even if she supports Joe Biden. This is all relevant. It's important. And I think it's also important to acknowledge how experts say it is very common for sexual assault survivors to change their story. Because, again, it makes sense. Like, you're not going to share everything right away if you're not comfortable. This is why a lot of sexual assault survivors, they don't even speak out. Because... This is this is not just painful to relive. It's embarrassing. Like you don't want to disclose these details, right? Who wants to do that? You don't want to bring this onto yourself. Um, but you know, I will give credit to Mika Brzezinski because she did actually do a really comprehensive segment. And I thought that she did a phenomenal job just laying out all of the details. She gets into Tara's inconsistencies, but she also goes over how, you know, Tara's story is credible. And, you know, her claims have been corroborated by numerous individuals. The point is that everyone who's watching should have all of the details laid out. They should know everything that there is to know about this story. And ultimately, they can use that information and do what they want with it, right? If you want to demand that Joe Biden step down... I think that would be a smart move. I don't think that an alleged rapist should be the nominee because I believe Tareed. But I mean, the point is that they need the information. But what we're learning is that the information doesn't matter after all. Like MSNBC's audience didn't just need to know about this. They don't care. They know now. We can't say that they're ignorant. They just don't care. Their minds have been made up from the get-go, right? This is a cult. They don't care about objective facts. They just want their team across the finish line, as I stated. All they want for MSNBC to do is to shut the fuck up, confirm their biases, and move on to how bad Donald Trump is and talk about Russia some more, I'm assuming. And, you know, I'm going to show you the response because it really confirms that they have no core principles. You know, I'm not being hyperbolic when I describe their reaction. You have actress Deborah Messing trying to smear the victim by sharing a blog post about how Tara Reid allegedly stole money from some nonprofit organization. And look, even if this were true, it doesn't mean that she wasn't sexually assaulted. This does nothing to invalidate her claim. Uh, she also then thanked Lindsey Graham, who never believes women, but because he stood up for Joe Biden, well, you know, she is thanking him here. You have Richard Comey, who wrote one of the dumbest tweets I have ever read in my entire life, saying, Judging by the position of the female vagina, it will not be easy for anyone to just put their finger into the vagina unless there is some cooperation from the female herself. Did you catch that? I mean, this is some next-level stupidity. Next-level stupidity. But believe it or not, it gets worse because after, you know, liberals and MSNBC brained shit libs, uh, you know, spent time smearing Tari trying to assassinate her character, which is common in these types of publicized cases that happened to Christine Blasey Ford. You know, then Biden supporters moved on to attacking journalists, which is something that they say you should never do because it's bad when Trump does it. But here is uh, a bunch of Biden supporters now attacking journalists. You have Biden or Buster Lindy Lee tweet out, Now that Tara Reid's story has completely imploded, it hasn't, I hope the FBI investigates Nathan J. Robinson, Katie Halper, and Ryan Grimm for their role in this fraud. Tara, or whatever your actual name is, you have gravely harmed real Me Too survivors. Chris Jackson tweeted, Who thinks Ryan Grimm should release any correspondence he has had with Reed considering she telegraphed her hit job to him in a tweet a month ago? And after writing a thoughtful piece for the New York Times about why Democrats should ditch Joe Biden, uh, Elizabeth Brunig shared this letter that she received from a reader who writes, your recent column about the big fat tub of shit who is spouting lies about Biden and expecting ultra lib femme dyke bleeding hearts like you to believe her was as wrong minded as anyone can get. Don't you see that you have already tried and convicted an innocent man over something that, as he put so well, never happened? Can't you see when you're being conned? I don't know where you came from, but the time should get rid of you and allow you to slink back into that hole. So in case you lost track, they first smeared Tara Reid or attempted to. After that, they went after journalists who helped to pub publicize this story. And then they called on some of them to be fired, called on any journalist who dared to ask for some accountability to be fired, sent them nasty letters. And uh, predictably, all of this has culminated in Tara Reid receiving threats 
and nonstop harassment. The same exact thing happened with Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. The same people who said that what happened to her was disgusting are now doing the same thing, albeit for a different victim. Zero consistency whatsoever because they didn't care about the details. They don't care about believing survivors. This is about their team winning and that's it. That's what this is about. They don't care about ideology. They don't care about policy. These people are not principled. They don't care. That's what's been made incredibly clear over the course of the last week. They're literally doing exactly what defenders of Donald Trump and Brett Kavanaugh did. They're smearing the victim and attacking journalists. Because how dare anyone believe that a man who literally sniffs women's hair on camera and touches them inappropriately and invades their personal space, openly flirts with women. I mean, how could anyone think that this person would possibly take things a little bit further when the cameras weren't on, considering how far he goes, when he knows that they're filming him? How dare you even question this? So, I mean, all that stuff about believing women, there's a huge caveat. Only believe women when they accuse Republicans. And the same is probably true for Republicans. I mean, we've seen the hypocrisy. Trump Jr. is tweeting out, you know, stories about Tara Reid when his father has been accused of sexual assault, when he defended Brett Kavanaugh. So nobody's hands are clean here except for the left. Everyone is a hypocrite. It's always, you know, we'll use these allegations if they're politically convenient. And that's the only time we're going to purport to care. And... The person who had, I think, the most profound response to this is Jamie Peck, who, you know, on Majority Report in a recent episode, I think she said everything that we needed to hear right now and what we're all feeling. Take a look. I guess I should back up and say first that I believe her. Um, there was a lot of concurrent reporting, which we're seeing come out, and the story rings very true to me, as I'm sure it does many survivors of sexual assault and uh workplace sexual harassment. It's very normal for survivors to change their stories based on cues they're getting about how they're going to be received if they don't feel safe. Of course, they're not going to tell you the whole thing. Um, I said like six months ago on this show that I wouldn't be surprised if Biden had a Me Too coming. Um, right. And people thought that it sounded a little far-fetched, but this stuff exists on a continuum. And seeing the way that he uh, touches women in public it's not that surprising to me that he'd also do it in a worse way in private. Um, if, if, you, if you listen to him on Morning Joe today, um, he wouldn't even say that he remembers her, which makes me sick, but is also probably true because like he said, she was nothing to him. He did it incredibly casually and also he's fucking senile. So I, I believe that he probably doesn't remember it and he's just used to having people cover up for his I mean I mean this is like another side point about how hmm, maybe people shouldn't be in positions of immense power for that long because it, it tends to both attract people who like having power over others and also it, it can corrupt people right, right. um uh, so so going forward like the democrats have bet on the fact that nobody's going to care about this and on now, a societal level they're probably right but we saw this during the kavanaugh hearing right i was a hundred percent sure nothing was going to come of it because this society does not care about survivors of sexual assault and at the time a lot of democrats were saying the right things they were right about this that guy should not be on the supreme court now we have a bunch of people who said that stuff back then, deleting their old tweets about it and turning around and doing exactly what the Republicans were doing to Christine Blasey Ford, attacking her character, attacking her as a Russian asset, saying she's got a screw loose. It, it, it really, it, it's disgusting. Um, and I, I, I know that I've argued for the Me Too movement in the past because although it itself is not a radical phenomenon, um, it has a limited analysis, but it can point in radical directions, right? If we turn it into a conversation about power and the wider problems of the things that suck about having to work for a boss who has absolute power over you, right? But I, I think Me Too itself has been largely corrupted and co-opted by 
the establishment. Um, we see this with Anita Dunn's relationship with Time's Up. This person should not be in charge of this kind of thing. Um, and it, it's entanglements with the NGO industrial complex, which basically exists to launder the reputations of wealthy liberals and their children. They do some good work, but it is essentially a bourgeois institution in that it upholds the existing power structures. So maybe we need a different kind of Me Too that has a, a more radical analysis, a more independent uh, existence independently of these bourgeois institutions. I don't know. Um, it's just, it, it's really depressing to me and it's depressing to see the Democratic Party going the same route that they went with Bill Clinton, right? Like we have two alleged rapists running for president and I, I really think a socialist feminist analysis is the only thing that can explain it right now. That was great. That was great. And I'll link you to the full video because she does say more. So I'll put that in the description box. But what she says here is profound. Look, it is really depressing. Like, I never was under the assumption that Democrats believed in anything. But I at least thought that the Democratic Party's base was a little bit more ideological or principled than, you know, leadership in the party. But they genuinely don't care. And there's something inherently heartbreaking about that, right? This election is full mask off for liberals and centrists. Full mask off. Nobody cares. Um, they don't care. I don't know what else to say. This has revealed that. So it's certainly frustrating. You know, I, I felt hopeful that survivors of sexual assault were actually going to see a new culture in America because of the Me Too movement and all of the strides that we've made. But as you can see, you can only push so far until, you know, you accuse the wrong person. And then the, the movement's over. It's just, it's genuinely heartbreaking. And there's nothing left to say. Centrists just don't care. You can give them all of the details. You could probably show them a video of Joe Biden committing a crime. And uh, they are not going to abandon their support for him. It's like Donald Trump. You know, his supporters will never leave him. And the same is true for Democrats. They're going to support Democrats no matter what. Because, you know, that cult mentality, that team sport mentality, it's just too strong for us to break through. It doesn't matter how much facts and objectivity, you know, we try to bring to this conversation. They just don't care. They're not like you and I. They have no principles. They have no morals. Or they do only up to a certain point. Look, lover or hater, you've got to hand it to Joy Reid. She is a very talented propagandist. And yes, she is a hack, but she's a clever hack because she managed to pull off something that I didn't think was possible. She took the Joe Biden Tara Reid story and somehow twisted this into an anti Bernie Sanders story about the notorious Bernie bros who have a plot to overthrow Joe Biden and install Bernie Sanders as the Democratic Party's nominee. Yes, she put this out there, and I think she is relatively convincing if you're already kind of predispositioned to believe the bullshit that MSNBC spouts on a regular basis. So we're going to get to that, but also I want to talk about how she managed to assassinate the character of Tara Reid, or at least attempt to, but I think this will land with her audience, by preying on the conspiratorial instincts of the average MSNBC viewer. And she's trying to smear Tara Reid by using Russian hysteria and McCarthyism. And what she does here should definitely be written about by scholars of media and media bias for decades to come. This clip should be featured in the sequel to Manufacturing Consent, if there ever is one. Take a look. Most weirdly, back in 2018, Reid wrote a series of blog posts extravagantly praising Russian President Vladimir Putin who intelligence agencies say wage cyber warfare against the United States in order to get Donald Trump elected president. In one such blog post, which she published on Medium and has since been deleted, entitled, Why a Liberal Democrat Supports Vladimir Putin, she wrote, quote, President Putin has an alluring combination of strength with gentleness. His sensuous image projects his love for life, the embodiment of grace while facing adversity. Ms. Reid now says that her praise of Putin was misguided. So that is what I like to call a good old fashioned smear. Because the subtext of that clip was that 
you know, since she loves Vladimir Putin so much, and since Vladimir Putin loves Donald Trump, well, if you connect the dots, maybe, I'm not going to say, but maybe Vladimir Putin put Tara Reid up to this. Maybe he convinced her to fabricate these sexual assault allegations against Joe Biden and help Donald Trump win. She didn't say it, but that's what she was priming you to believe. She didn't have to say it to get you to think about that. But I have a counterpoint. Maybe it's the case that not everything is a conspiracy. Maybe Tara Reid just has a bad opinion, a wrong opinion about Russia, Russian politics, and Vladimir Putin, but that she also simultaneously was, in fact, sexually assaulted by Joe Biden. I mean, two things can be true at the same time. She could be wrong about Russia, but be telling the truth about Joe Biden. Now, Joy Reid would never point this out because that wouldn't serve her political agenda. But nonetheless, MSNBC viewers aren't going to question this because they trust Joy Reid. They think that what she's doing is, you know, espousing information that they need to know. She thinks that you need to know that these pro-Vladimir Putin blog posts by Tara Reid discredit everything that she's saying. And to make matters worse, we bring in the Bernie Bro conspiracy theory about how this is all just the plot for us to basically push Joe Biden out and get what we wanted all along. Bernie Sanders as the nominee. And she's the only pundit who's brave enough to call this out. Except that's not really what anyone is saying. Do I want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee? Yes. Do I believe if we were successful at getting Joe Biden to step down, that all of a sudden the DNC would just bring out Bernie Sanders and be like, all right, kids, you did it. Congratulations. No, that's not what anyone's asking for. Basically, what we're calling for is just generalizing here. Joe Biden, step aside. Let the rest of the nominating process play out. Let people vote. We don't have to go with him. He hasn't clenched the nomination officially. He hasn't reached that magic number of 1991. So why can't we just let the remaining people who were in the race unsuspend their campaigns, come back and compete for the nomination aggressively? I mean, I haven't seen anyone say, let's install Bernie Sanders. Nonetheless, that's what she wants you to think that we want to do. So she tweeted out, For Sanders diehards, it at least seems to be about letting the media needle Biden into resigning and somehow replacing him on the ticket with Sanders. Although in the unlikely event Biden did that, why wouldn't he just cede his delegates to, say, a woman? Well, I mean, because logic and fairness dictates that the person who was in second place should be the front runner to be the nominee but nonetheless she continues here if sanders was the nominee or was on his way to gaining the nomination would his supporters be pushing this case or helping miss reed in the same way is she what they care most about or is it getting that nomination by any means necessary having not gotten it via votes so what we're kind of seeing here is a little bit of projection since she is nothing more than a political hack, since she believes in nothing, she assumes that we all don't believe in nothing also, like her, right? Except I do believe in Tara Reid. I do believe that we should do everything in our power to make women feel comfortable to come out and share their stories, right? Now, certainly, I'll admit that I think that this would be less relevant for sure if Joe Biden wasn't seeking the highest office in the land. But I mean, you could flip this and ask the same question about her advocacy for Christine Blasey Ford. Did you only care about her because Brett Kavanaugh was needed to needing to be stopped? Or would you care, you know, if he wasn't going to be on the Supreme Court? I mean, you can ask the same questions about everything you and your colleagues were saying about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. You can care about the woman in this story, but also acknowledge that it is especially relevant if they are seeking a position of power where they will be dictating policy, ultimately, that is going to impact women, every woman in the country. Don't you think that that is more relevant? I think she knows she's just, you know, being intentionally obtuse here, but there's more. She tweeted out, and has any journalist who's been covering Biden for a long time or anyone from the 08 campaign done any writing on why these complaints, if they were written and to supervisors, didn't come up in the Obama vetting process or during the general, or did they? I genuinely don't know. Uh, maybe it's because Obama isn't infallible. In fact, he's a really bad person, objectively speaking. If you think murder is bad, killing innocent civilians in, you know, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, if you think that's bad, then Obama isn't a god. Maybe we shouldn't just think any and everything that he does is good. Or, you know, maybe they would have, you know, not selected Biden if they knew about this, but they didn't. Maybe they just messed up. 
Or maybe Tari didn't want to share her allegation. The point is that what you're using here is a tactic straight from the Republican playbook. Remember what they were saying about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford? Well, why is this coming up all of a sudden now that he is nominated to be on the Supreme Court? Why didn't she bring this up sooner? It's the same question that we were asking, that Republicans were asking back then, and now Democrats are asking this, albeit about Tara Reid. It's political hackery that is so, so transparent that it's embarrassing. You'd think they'd be embarrassed anyways, but uh, they're not. They're not. And uh, she said more about this on her program. And it's just, you know, honestly, you would think that there would be some mechanism in Joy Reid's brain that would trigger some level of shame, right? That would make her think, maybe this makes me look like a hack. I probably shouldn't talk about this too much because it's embarrassing. It's not a good look. And this comes after she lied about time traveling hackers writing homophobic blog posts for her. But I mean, nonetheless, she talks about how this is definitely a plot from the Bernie Bros to install Bernie and rig the nomination. We also have, uh, have to talk about the timing of all of this. Ms. Reid made her allegations public in late March when the primary was down to just Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, and days before Sanders announced he was suspending his campaign. Some Biden supporters have questioned Ms. Reid's motives because of that timing. Ms. Reid voted for Sanders in the California primary, and that, of course, doesn't mean that she's not believable. But some Sanders supporters have used the allegations to call for Biden to be replaced on the Democratic ticket because of these claims with the implication that Sanders should replace him. Okay, so this is why her conspiracy theory doesn't make sense. If Tara Reid decided hypothetically to fabricate these allegations, why would she choose to time it after Joe Biden had already basically locked up the nomination? Wouldn't you, if you're trying to have the biggest impact, target you know that time after Bernie Sanders won Nevada and uh, before Joe Biden won South Carolina because it seemed like he had momentum as we inched closer towards South Carolina, he picked up Jim Clyburn's endorsement. So wouldn't she choose to then drop these allegations if, I mean, targeting Joe Biden and hurting Joe Biden was her only goal if she wanted to help Bernie Sanders? I mean, you'd think, right? But instead, she chose to come out with these allegations when Bernie was already losing. If anything, you can argue maybe she didn't want to hurt Joe Biden, which is why she came out with this after he already had the nomination basically locked up, after he sweeped on Super Tuesdays 2 and 3. But Joy Reid is just trying to get the audience to think, you know, maybe this is a made-up allegation. Maybe she isn't doing this because she actually was assaulted by Joe Biden. I couldn't believe that someone who sniffs women's hair on television would ever do this, but I mean, maybe she just wanted to, you know, hurt Joe Biden, and maybe this is a plot to have Bernie Sanders installed. And there's a little bit more on this that I want to talk about. Take a look. The, the, the couple of the challenges that, that I think people are having with the whole way this is playing out is that on the one hand, there's concern for Tara Reid, um, for her to have closure, you know, her accusations to be looked into properly. And then there's the sense that, that the people who are pushing this the hardest don't primarily care about her. There is this subtext of this being some kind of an opportunity to maybe ultimately get for Senator Sanders a nomination that he didn't win the old-fashioned way, right? So you had Claire Sandberg, who is Senator Sanders' 2020 National Organizing Director, tweet, uh, now is the time to deal with the ramifications of Tara Reid's accusations. Sorry, this is not cut nine for my uh, producers. Not this fall. There is simply no moral justification for Biden to continue as the presumptive nominee out of respect for survivors and for the good of the country. He should withdraw from the race. That kind of thing is what's unnerving, I think, a lot of people about how this is going. So this is just more projection from Joy Reid. Because she's a hack, she thinks everyone is as equally hacky as she is. But believe it or not, we do believe in the Me Too movement. We believe in these types of political causes, right? Not everyone is always acting for purposes of political gain, believe it or not. But she's a pundit. She only thinks about these things in terms of what the payoff will be and whether or not she's going to take a stand will hinge on if there will be a political payoff of some sort. Now, she also shared Claire Sandberg's tweet to supposedly, you know, prove that this is all nothing more than a plot to bring back Bernie Sanders. But in that tweet, Claire Sandberg didn't even mention Bernie Sanders. And she she's basically making a straw man that we want to just... 
Me Too Biden out of the race so Bernie can win, rather than have, having him uh, win the old-fashioned way is what she said. Yes, because let's pretend that MSNBC cares about winning the old-fashioned way after when Bernie Sanders was leading, when it looked like he was going to get a plurality, your colleagues were defending the prospect of superdelegates stealing the nomination away from Bernie Sanders in order to give it to someone like Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden. So don't pretend like you're principled and you care about winning votes because you were one of the loudest cheerleaders defending the DNC's rigging of the 2016 primary. You insufferable hack. But I'm not even mad because this is what we expect from Joy Reid. But look, let, let me just put it all out there so she can hear it from one of the highest ranking members, I think, of the Brotherhood of the Bernard. Would I like for Bernie Sanders to be the nominee? Yes, I think that that is obvious. But what do I want to come of all of this? I want Joe Biden to step down and I want the rest of the states to vote, right? Maybe he doesn't even step down. Maybe voters just have this information and everyone else unsuspends their campaigns. And if he wins, he wins. I just want there to feel like there's some ramifications for this. Some accountability, any accountability is really what I'm looking for. But should Joe Biden be replaced by Bernie Sanders? Sure, if he can win. If you don't want Joe Biden to be replaced by Bernie Sanders then you're admitting that you don't care about this rape allegation. It's not even about Bernie Sanders. Substitute Bernie Sanders for anyone else. Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren. I would prefer Bernie Sanders, but the principle is we shouldn't have a rapist, an alleged rapist, be the nominee. And, you know, maybe my opinion is invalid here because I actually do believe Tara Reid because I don't think it's surprising that someone who sniffs women's hair and had other women come forward and say that he made them feel uncomfortable. You know, I, I don't think that this is too unbelievable here. But the point is, we can do better than Joe Biden. And it doesn't matter if you think, oh, this is a plot to bring back Bernie Sanders. We're saying, let the competition play out. It's halfway over. Primaries were postponed because of COVID-19. Just bring all the candidates back. Let's have a vote. We don't have to go forward with the rapist. This doesn't have to be about Bernie Sanders. If the competition were to, you know, uh, happen again, if everyone unsuspended their campaigns in a perfect world, I would absolutely aggressively and relentlessly advocate for Bernie Sanders. But I'm not delusional enough to think that he would be guaranteed a victory. I'm not delusional enough to think that the DNC or Democratic Party leaders would install Bernie Sanders. If anything, what would happen is... Joe Biden would probably step down and Obama behind the scenes, as he usually does, would get, you know, uh, everyone to coalesce around some other Democrat not named Bernie Sanders, anyone but Bernie Sanders. The point is, why are you just OK with a rapist, an alleged rapist being the, the nominee? I mean, it's just you, you have to have some standards. And I get that you don't like purity tests, but how could you not be just disgusted by the fact that your choice will be between the lesser of two rapists like how does that not just make you feel queasy about the state of american politics thinking about that well it doesn't matter because joy reed is doing exactly as she's paid to do tow the party line and the dnc has already made it very clear they're not going to look into joe biden they believe joe biden tom perez is you know a team player he came from the obama biden administration so Chances are nothing will come of this, but, um, you know, at least centrists, they went full mask off and they showed their true colors if you didn't already see them for what they were before all of this. But it truly is disgusting, but I will hand it to Joy Reid. That is uh, really, really, I think, effective propaganda. I think the only person who is uh, even close to her in terms of pushing propaganda when she's at her best is Tucker Carlson. But this is truly just, I mean, this stuff, I think it works, right? If you can attach motive to a conspiracy that you're trying to gin up, then that is really effective, especially if you've been priming your audience over the years to believe that, you know, Vladimir Putin is basically controlling every aspect of, you know, democratic life in America. I mean, just by tweeting about Tara Reid, I'm reminded what it's like to be called a Russian stooge or asset or a tool because I was called a Russian tool. Everyone is a Russian working for Vladimir Putin or a Russian bot. 
if they don't, you know, uh, denounce Tara Reid immediately and believe that Joe Biden is innocent and the man who sniffs women's hair is, you know, not even remotely capable of doing something like this. I mean, we live in idiocracy, the movie. The fact that people believe effective propagandists like, you know, Joy Reid, it doesn't matter how effective and persuasive you are. People should have common sense and know better, right? But the fact that they're not shows that we're really worse off than I think we even thought we were in America. Because um, centrists, they may be too far gone. I mean, we know that MAGA chats are too far gone, but centrists, after they've kind of revealed themselves as, you know, party before everything else, I don't know how we can convince these people if, you know, facts, details, or just making a moral case isn't going to already convince them to just do the right thing. So as time goes on, as the lockdown continues, we're seeing more and more of these anti-quarantine protests pop up, and they are emerging in various states almost every single week, in California, Michigan, and even in my home state of Oregon. Over the weekend, we saw a reopen Oregon rally take place after Governor Kate Brown announced that the lockdown was extended until July 6th. And some of the images that I saw from this rally it killed my soul because this is all, you know, a contingent of the population that is, for lack of a better word, batshit crazy. I mean, you see them holding up signs, you know, referencing QAnon, Q sent me. These are largely, you know, uh, pro-Trump MAGA chuds doing this. And, you know, I'm sympathetic to the economic issues that are going to pop up with these types of extended lockdowns. And, you know, largely we have to blame govern government because... If they actually address the economic concerns of people who can't go to work adequately, there would be less rebellion. There would be less need to, you know, have this urgent reopening of the economy in whatever capacity that may be. Um, but I want to highlight a couple of these anti-quarantine protests that kind of went off the rails. There was one in California where they, um, a crowd of people, largely I'm assuming pro-Trump individuals based on, you know, what they were wearing, we're screaming in the faces of police officers, and if you can, try to pay attention to some of the signs that they brought to this rally. So almost no one was wearing a mask. Um, as you can see, obviously, they weren't standing six feet apart. And in case you missed it, that first sign at the beginning said vaccines known to cause seizures. So nobody wants to, you know, endure a prolonged lockdown. But these dipshits don't realize that they're making it worse. If we don't hunker down longer, then there will be more cases of COVID-19, which will lead to, you know, a need for longer lockdowns. I mean, Georgia just reopened their state back up. And guess what happened immediately? A thousand people got COVID-19 because their idiotic governor decided, you know what? We're going to open up the state again. You're making it worse. If you truly want the lockdown to be over, this is not helping. This is making it worse. Now, again... 100% sympathetic to the economic concerns. Use that energy to call up your representative. Use that energy to demand universal basic income, rent cancellation, because that's the true solution, not for you to go back to work and risk your life for capitalism. The solution is an economic fix so we can withstand a prolonged lockdown, but that's not happening. So yes, government has failed, but this also isn't helping. This also isn't helping. Now, I want to highlight a reopen Wisconsin rally because after seeing, you know, all of these anti-quarantine protests pop up, uh, you know, it was really soul crushing. It was depressing. But this video made me feel better. And I think it's going to make you feel better as well. 
because you had one person who decided to troll these protesters and risk his own life to basically tell them to eat shit and call them dipshits. Take a look. God hates dipshits. Fuck you. 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 Thank you. Fuck you. Fuck you. God hates dipshits. Fuck you. Fuck you. Can you explain? Give me a little more of that, will ya? I love it. Explain why you're just saying fuck you and being vile to These people are risking people's lives, including your own. They are not. They are. Yeah, you I expect none of these people. I, suppose, don't I do believe in science. You're so full of shit. I do shit. believe in science. You're so full of shit. Okay, yep, science is wrong. Yep, fuck you. No, science is fuck right. Fuck you. Science is right. Have, have you looked at the models, idiot? Yep, I have looked at the models. And what do they look like? Bad. They go from 2.5 million dead to under 50,000. Fuck you. More people are killed by the Fuck you. Yeah, you're Oh, it's idiot. just the flu. I know, it's you're just the flu. It's a virus. Idiot. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you. Yes, yeah, post me. Fuck Trump. God hates Trump. God hates dipshits. Fuck you. Thank you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Selfish prick. Fuck you. Look at your cheap Walmart shoes. These are actually Reeboks. CrossFit. They're pretty expensive. Yeah, get a real job. Get an essential job, you piece of shit. Get an essential job. Fuck you. Get an essential job. Fuck you. Ooh, good one. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you, an American piece of shit. Oh, the Reich, yeah. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You can take pictures of other people too. <laughs> Fuck you, no one wants here. Fuck you. Fuck you. Nice daddy issues. Fuck you and your daddy issues. Fuck you. Fuck you, get an essential job. Get an essential job. Get an essential job. Get an essential job. Go to work. God hates dipshits. God hates dipshits. Fuck you. Fuck you. Swearing around little kids like that? You're putting your kids at risk from a virus that is very deadly. Oh, and I'm the asshole. Hey, asshole. Are, you are you loud here? I'm sorry, no, sorry. it fell. No, oh. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Please stay six feet away, sir. Are Fuck you. Right you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. I can't wait to be on Breitbart. Shut Fuck down you. all the hospitals and no one's getting care right oh, now. Oh, okay. No one's getting care. Sure. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you. Keep filming. Fuck you. Fuck you. There you go, loser. Yes, thank you. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. This is what a little dick Fuck looks you. like. Right? <laughs> oh, dick yeah. jokes. Nice. Dick, Good one. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, a little bucket dick. Fuck, Fuck you. You're a psychologist, too. Didn't you Fuck bring you. your couch for everybody Fuck today? You. Can I ask you why you're this, saying this Fuck you? This is liberalism in America. You are right? all endangering little people's dick. lives because little you're selfish. Little 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 I'm a mask. I'm trying to stay six feet away if you mind. This is what liberalism What am I doing? Protesting you, dipshits. Fuck you. Fuck you. I'm concerned because I have members of my family who have autoimmune diseases who will die because you dipshits can't don't believe science. So fuck you. You don't know enough about science. I love that. And I salute you for your service, Patriot. That was uh that was great. And I can't help but think that that was, you know, Matt Chrisman from Chapa Trap House because the guy sounded exactly like Matt Chrisman. Uh, but I mean, that was really, really great because these people are endangering their lives. And what's astonishing to me is that they're more concerned with the language that he was using in front of children than the fact that they brought their children to this rally and potentially exposed them to a deadly virus that's highly, highly contagious. I mean, their priorities are all out of whack. All out of whack. Like, it reminds me of when I worked at Blockbuster, not to go off on a tangent, but I worked at Blockbuster, and I remember a customer distinctly who asked, does this movie have, you know, a lot of violence or a lot of sex in it? And my response was, and I don't remember the movie, no, it doesn't have a lot of sex scenes, but there's like a really graphic scene where somebody's head was chopped off. And the response was, oh, I don't care about that, as long as there's, there's no sex. Okay, so as long as there's nothing natural taking place, I'm fine with my kids seeing, you know, someone's head explode. But if they see a boob, that is crossing the line. 
I mean, the logic makes no sense. One is, I think, clearly worse than the other because one is natural, one is not natural. You know, it's not natural to uh, chop off someone's head or, you know, do violence, but it is natural to um, have sex. <laughs> so I just, it doesn't make sense to me. But nonetheless, you know, this is their uh, priorities. Um, and I just love that he kept telling people, God hates dipshits, fuck you. I mean, this man is so brave, so brave, because if I've learned anything over the course of the last uh, few years, it's that right-wingers are completely insane and unpredictable, and I don't trust them, and um, yeah, I'm scared of them. I don't care if that makes me look like a beta male cuck. Uh, these people are batshit loony, and I'm not going to taunt them. I'm not going to do that, but he did, um, and the worst that you know was hurled his way were these cringeworthy boomer jokes. Uh, your mom's giving blowjobs, and they also made dick jokes. That's just, I mean, these people are so, so stupid. So um, this was really satisfying to watch. But I will say, you know, it, it's difficult for me to just condemn these individuals, even though they are loony, right? The Trump supporters, QAnon people, they're insane. However, we have to acknowledge that there are economic concerns that are very legitimate. And I think that, you know, not all of these people... Um, are coming out to protest, you know, uh, because they're hurting economically. Some of these people are just conspiratorial dipshits and, you know, they're anti-vaxxers. But putting those people aside, there is a portion of people who want us to get back to business as usual as quickly as possible because they are hurting economically. They're, you know, laid off. They lost their job and as a result lost their health care. So I get that sense. I, I feel the urgency. I know people who have been affected. So, you know, a large portion of this can be blamed on the ineffectual response or lack thereof from government, um, mostly the federal government, because the state governments don't have the resources to do what the federal government is able to. So, you know, you've, you've got to blame government, but at the same time, if you're going to voice your concerns, literally putting your life in danger and exposing everyone else and basically prolonging the lockdown because you're facilitating even more spreading of COVID-19, it's not the right way to go about this. So, I mean, these people, they have to stop fucking doing this. I mean, we're not the only country that has seen these types of anti-quarantine protests. Other countries have had these types of, you know, events pop up, but we're certainly one where it's happening the most frequently. And that's really terrifying. It's scary. So, um, yeah, I really commend the person who trolled them and, uh, I, I'll just advise them. Don't do that again because these people are crazy and I, I don't trust them. Uh, I think they would probably, at least some of them will be inclined to assault you, get in your face, cough in your face. I, I don't trust these people. They're crazy. And I don't trust most people, not just MAGA chuds and, you know, QAnon dipshits. But I mean, yeah, uh, very, very, uh, entertaining, albeit I was worried for him. It's day 60-something of the lockdown. Society hasn't necessarily crumbled yet. Stores are still open. Food is still widely available in spite of a couple of shortages that pop up here and there. But for the most part, we can still survive. Nonetheless, Alex Jones of InfoWars is already talking about the necessity of maybe possibly resorting to cannibalism in the near future. Take a look. Gay! I will eat my neighbors. I'm not letting my kids die. I'll, I'm just going to be honest. My superpowers being honest, I've extrapolated this out, and I won't have to for a few years since I got food and stuff, but I'm literally looking at my neighbors now and going, am I ready to hang them up and gut them and skin them and chop them up? And you know what? I'm ready. My daughters aren't starving to death. I'll eat my neighbors. See, my superpowers being honest, I'll eat your ass. I will. I'm combat model, optimum self-sufficiency, probably the leader. The point is, is have you thought about that yet? Because I'm somebody that thought I could fix this, and I'm starting to think about having to eat my neighbors. You think I like sizing up my neighbor, how I'm going to haul him up by a chain and chop his ass up? I'll do it. My children aren't going hungry. I will eat your ass. And that's why I want the globalists to know, I will eat your ass first. <laughs> wow wow um i don't i don't know what to say about that but quote i'll eat your ass alex jones 2020 
like there's no conclusion other than he wants to eat his neighbor like if anyone's gonna be better off it's gonna be someone like him with a lot of money and according to him he already has food rationed so i mean he's put food aside he's gonna be okay but yet his neighbor is looking uh, kind of tasty and he says <laughs> you think i like sizing up my neighbor how i'm gonna haul him up <laughs> by a chain and chop his ass up I mean, imagine the look on his neighbor's face <laughs> as he's watching Alex Jones go on this deranged rant about uh, eating him. I'll eat my neighbors. I mean, I genuinely feel bad for anyone who lives near Alex Jones. Like, that's got to be, like, horrifying. Like, first of all, he, you know, is probably, like, a loud person, but also he's crazy, so you probably hear him yelling. And the fact that now he's talking about, like, literally eating his neighbors. Um, look, I expected this to happen right but i was thinking we're gonna start talking about cannibalism maybe on year like three or four um of the lockdown in the apocalypse not like two months in when we still can get food when stores are still open and you could just go to the store and purchase food you shouldn't go very frequently but nonetheless i mean it's there if you need it don't have to eat your neighbors now I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a tweet from Caitlin Bennett, otherwise known as Gun Girl, who uh, shared a picture of herself with Alex Jones and included the hashtag Alex Jones eats ass. I'll eat your ass. Okay. Look, do me a favor once you close out this video. Check on your right wing neighbor or friend or family member. They're not doing okay. <laughs> They're not doing okay. Uh, check on them to make sure that they still have all of their faculties in order and they're not going crazy because, um, you know, if you thought that the far right was crazy, this lockdown is uh, showing that there is no, you know, uh, there's no level that they won't stoop to. There's no level of crazy that they're not willing to go to. They are absolutely insane. So much so that I think that the movie Idiocracy, like sometimes I'll jokingly say that we're living in that movie and that it wasn't supposed to be a documentary. I think that some right wingers like Alex Jones surpassed the level of stupid that we saw in the movie Idiocracy. That's how bad I think it's gotten. I mean, when you have people like the president of the United States literally asking whether or not injecting disinfectants into our bodies would be a solution that could fight COVID-19. I mean, there's just, it's as stupid as, you know, the president in idiocracy watering the crops with Gatorade and wondering why all the crops were dying. It, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Certain things leave me speechless, but it doesn't happen very often. But when it does, it's gotta be something crazy. And this is one of those things. Um, But at the back of my mind, I will admit, I think that, I believe Alex Jones' attorneys when he says that he was an actor, basically, an entertainer. Because, I mean, is he genuine about this? Do I think that he actually wants to eat his neighbor? I don't believe so. I think that he knows what he's doing. I think he knows that he's a huckster and he's an entertainer. And the only reason why he has a show is to hawk his, you know, dumbass, um, I don't know, what is he even still selling? Brain pills? Just weird vitality stuff? Like... The man is a fraud. He's just trying to make money and being over the top and entertaining is part of his shtick. So in a way, you know, I'm I'm part of the problem by participating in this and shedding light on his stupidity. But when you see something like this, I mean, how do you not respond? Like, I, I can't not talk about this. Alex Jones is talking about cannibalism and specifically he wants to eat his neighbor's ass. I mean, I, I just can't remain silent as this happens. So hopefully you'll forgive me. I will try to do better and talk about things that actually matter <laughs> in the future because um, Alex Jones is not someone who needs any more attention. I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but George W. Bush is a war criminal. He is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million Iraqi citizens. This man tortured people he should be in prison right now but he's not and the fact that he isn't spending the rest of his life in jail 
should be an outrage to everyone. So for those of you who forgot, this is a bad person. So we recently talked about how the New York State Board of Elections was trying to purge everyone but Joe Biden's name from the ballot in their upcoming primary and how that was being challenged in a court of law by individuals like Andrew Yang and delegates to Andrew Yang. Um, and guess what? I'm sure you already have heard by now, but a judge ruled in Andrew Yang's favor and overturned the decision of the New York State Board of Elections. So, uh, in other words, the primary is back on. Andrew Yang single-handedly saved democracy in New York. Credit where it's due. So, as Matt Stevens and Nick Corasaniti of the New York Times explains, a federal judge on Tuesday ordered election officials in New York State to hold its Democratic primary election in June and reinstate all qualifying candidates on the ballot. The ruling came after the presidential primary was canceled late last month over concerns about the coronavirus. The order, filed by Judge Annalisa Torres of the United States District Court, came in response to a lawsuit filed last week by the former Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang. He sought to undo the New York State Board of Elections decision in late April to cancel the June 23rd contest, a move it attributed to health and safety worries and the fact that the results would not change the primary's outcomes. On Tuesday night, Douglas A. Kellner, a co-chair of the New York Board of Elections, said the board was reviewing the decision and preparing an appeal and speaking on CNN. Governor Andrew Cuomo said the presidential primary would proceed per the court's ruling, at least for the time being, but he noted the potential for an appeal. Okay, so let me just say that uh, this doesn't just put Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang's names back on the ballot. This puts all of the presidential contenders back on the ballot. This isn't just a win for Bernie Sanders supporters. This is a win for everyone who is supporting someone other than Joe Biden, which is most Democratic Party primary voters. Although Andrew Yang is the one who catalyzed this move, and I absolutely applaud him. You've got to give him credit for this. He did this. Bernie Sanders just wrote a strongly worded letter. Andrew Yang took action in the form of filing a lawsuit, and that's what you want to do if you actually want to affect change. So my hat goes off to Andrew Yang. He made the correct choice to do this, and we all benefit from his courage. So we absolutely have to give Andrew Yang credit. And let me just say for Andrew Cuomo, the fact that him and the New York State Board of Elections are saying they're going to appeal this really shows you the contempt that they have for the Democratic Party's base. It shows you they don't care about democracy, right? And it's not like the DNC is the only institution within the broader party apparatus that's corrupt. I mean, state democratic parties are equally as corrupt. They are all working at the behest of the establishment because, you know, they're going to go where the power is flowing, you know, because that's that's how they are able to have a bigger influence. So if you side with Joe Biden, he's going to pay you back when he's in power, you know? And I don't know what that looks like. Maybe a position within his administration. Maybe he favors your state in some way. I don't know what that looks like. But I know that power is always what people are going to gravitate to, at least if you're corrupt and career-minded. Um, now, Andrew Yang responded with a statement via Twitter saying, quote, I'm glad that a federal judge agreed that depriving millions of New Yorkers of the right to vote was wrong. I hope that the New York Board of Elections takes from this ruling a newfound appreciation of their role in safeguarding our democracy. And I couldn't agree more. And look, let me just say this. The fact that we even have to challenge the Democratic Party in the court of law in and of itself is just, it shouldn't happen. They're the party that frequently speaks out against the voter suppression tactics and disenfranchisement that happens to their base when the Republicans do it. But here they are doing it to their own base, but not necessarily, you know, the base who uh, they want. The people who aren't going to fall in line, they just kind of want them brushed aside. And even if Joe Biden is a huge favorite to still win the Democratic primary, they still couldn't help themselves. They had to deprive voters of the choice because, you know, it's it's just, that's what they do. <laughs> there's, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. They just have to do things like this to spit in the eyes of the left. But when the left fights back, sometimes you can win. Sometimes you can win. It's just a matter of playing hardball and acknowledging that you can't lie down and take it. And I want this to be a lesson for leftists going forward, right? I thought that Bernie Sanders, you know, speaking out against this 
was important, but he just sent a letter to the New York State Board of Elections. He sent out an email telling people about what they did. He should have been one of the first people to file a lawsuit. And I'm not trying to dog on Bernie Sanders. And, you know, I don't want you to think that he's a bad person. It just shows you that one of the main things he could have done to possibly win was be stronger, actually take on the establishment. And if you want to win, that's what you have to do. It's not an option. You have to do it. And Andrew Yang is clearly playing to win. He put out a tweet saying that he absolutely is taking note of the people who aren't supporting direct cash payments during this pandemic, and rightfully so. I mean, he's the UBI guy. But now is a time where even if you didn't support universal basic income, generally speaking, you should at least support it throughout the duration of this primary. And if you're in the Democratic Party, I mean, it shouldn't even be debatable. So, you know, I applaud Andrew Yang. This was a courageous move. And um, it paid off. And let me just say this. This is something that was risky. Like, Andrew Yang most likely will be running for president again in 2024, assuming Joe Biden uh, isn't able to beat Trump or assuming he wins and then steps down or something. But he's going to be back. That's the point, right? He's running for president again. And if you want to run for president and you want to be successful in the Democratic Party, one thing that has been abundantly clear is that you have to find a way to win over the establishment and never question them. That's what we saw from Elizabeth Warren. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win. It just means that you'll receive less pushback from the establishment. Now, Elizabeth Warren, she uh, showed you how powerful they are at getting you to roll over and die. And as a result, you know, Democratic Party officials weren't freaking out about her. And they were freaking out about Bernie Sanders. So, I mean, these are the people, theoretically, you'd want to win over if you're going to run for president again. But the fact that Andrew Yang is still challenging them, it shows that, you know, um, he has a good strategy. He knows you have to take on the establishment head on. Otherwise, they're going to steamroll you. Never, ever just, you know, acquiesce. Never just let them get a victory over on you. Always fight, even if it seems like it's a lost cause. Fight, fight fight, never stop fighting. That should be the mentality that we have going forward as a left collectively. Otherwise, we're never going to win. So just keep that in mind. Whenever you think that fighting might not be the good option against the Democratic Party establishment or any institution in the United States, fight that instinct. Fight the system. You have to. Otherwise, you will lose every single time. Joe Biden's campaign put out a new promo and... I don't know why they did this. There's no reason for this. Um, it's so cringeworthy that it will make you want to die. I don't think that I've ever seen anything this cringeworthy. Like, if you thought I'm just chilling at Cedar Rapids or Pokemon Go to the polls was bad, take a look at this gem that Joe Biden's team thought that they should uh, curse us with. Keegan, do you have any threes? No, I don't. Do you have any nines? Yeah. I always start with dessert. Is the name Maurice funnier than Martin? I like Maurice. One R. Yeah, don't try too hard. <laughs> We're going on a speech that I'm going to need you to deliver. You try to find a place for the word loquacious. Forty-one down, comedy duo key and blank. How many E's and peel? Three. Three E's and peel. Three. This is thirteen. Come on, Keegan, you can do twenty. Keegan, I do everything forty-six these days. That's twenty. Do thirty, Keegan. Thirty. Ten more. Come on, Joe. Thirty. Pretty good, man. Yeah, is that guys? Nice? Pretty good. I'm still working on my sunglasses. But uh, Joe, I, I gotta get going. Where are you going? You're quarantined. You can't go anywhere. We're in quarantine. Yep, 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 you're right. You're right. King, do you have any threes? I do, Joe. Yes, I do. What was the point of that? What was the point of that video? There was no purpose whatsoever. And when you look at the like to dislike ratio, you'll see that people were a little bit turned off by it because it's patronizing. This is pandering. 
I don't care about celebrities that support your campaign. I don't. If you get a celebrity endorsement and, you know, I'm supporting you, cool. But at the end of the day, give us policies. That's it. You don't have to pander. You don't have to seem cool. You don't have to hello fellow kids us every five fucking minutes. Just give us policies. It could be the most boring, plain video imaginable. Just, you know, a black background with white text saying policies X, Y, and Z. That is better than this. This is is uh, irritating, it's cringeworthy, it's patronizing. I don't like seeing this. It makes me dislike you and Keegan-Michael Key. Yeah, Keegan-Michael Key, is that his name? It makes me dislike you and him more because this is just, it's stupid, it's brainless. There wasn't much planning involved. And I feel like maybe I'm being a little bit petty here, but when I saw this, like, it just made me hate politics even more than I already do. And I talk about politics for a living, right? So I should love all of this. I should eat this up. But I'm to the point where I'm so exhausted, where there's so much that needs to be fixed, that this type of shit does absolutely nothing. And like, going to some of the lines, they don't even make sense. Uh, this is what Keegan-Michael Key said. Is the name Maurice funnier than Martin? What does that even mean? I don't know what that means. Neither of them are funny names. They're just names. What does that mean? What are you implying? I, there's no point. They didn't even think this through. Like, I feel like they were just kind of um, going off script or just decided to turn on the camera and whatever happened, happened. They didn't, you know, watch it back and edit it. It was just stupidity. Uh, you had Joe Biden say, I'm working on a speech that I need you to deliver. Okay. I mean, what is the point? See, this irritates me because there's so many issues that he could be talking about. And I'm not saying that he needs to, you know, release an ad talking about Medicare for all because I'm not delusional enough to think that he would ever adopt any of the policies that the left wants him to adopt. But let's say that he tailored a policy specific video to, you know, the crowd of people who he wants to appeal to, the center and center right. Let's say, you know, he just put out an ad saying that he's more competent when it comes to COVID-19 than Trump. Hell, he could put out an ad just saying Vote for me if you want me to name the next replacement on the Supreme Court. And that would be a thousand times more effective than this. And I'm not saying that he doesn't put out those types of more policy specific ads, but he thinks that these types of ads, these types of videos that he puts out are going to help cultivate, you know, uh, uh, more of a personality around him, that he's not just this doddering fool who is an alleged rapist. He actually, you know, he has friends in the comedy world and he's funny. He's just like you and I, you know, he jokes around, he laughs, but it's not going to help him with any of that. Like, what are they thinking? And because I am a prick, <laughs> I'm going to uh, read a couple of comments from the Joe Biden subreddit uh, because I can't believe these are real. Like <laughs> uh, the fir the top comment says Joe Mentum. That's it. Uh, the next comment says, oh man, that was a pretty funny video. It deserves more likes. I made sure to like it. And then somebody replied to that saying, I do everything in 46 these days, had me laughing out loud. Really? It had you laughing out loud? Seriously? I just don't understand liberals. I don't understand them. I don't get them. They speak a language that I do not understand at all. I mean, think about this. Do you ever see the Republican Party putting out ads very frequently like this? I mean, they've done, you know, more lighthearted, stupid ads like this. But I mean, they're trying to win an election, and that's clear by their actions. Like, they're putting out hard-hitting ads. Trump's team released an ad hitting Nancy Pelosi for being out of touch and talking about all the expensive ice cream that she eats with her multi-thousand dollar refrigerators, you know, that are fully stocked. I mean, they're putting out ads... And they're telling us that they want to win an election. They're ghouls. They're disgusting. They are morally reprehensible. Their ideology is antiquated and antithetical to what human beings should stand for. Like, we should stand for each other and, you know, helping one another, lifting each other up. But this is a disgusting party of death and destruction. But one thing that's sh that I'm sure about with the Republican Party is that they want to win this election. When you see shit like this... It shows you how out of touch Democrats are, and they're not playing to win. And, you know, it's not like Joe Biden is the only one who does this. We saw it in 2016 with Hillary Clinton when she was doing all of these uh, pseudo campaign rallies, if you can even call them that, where she just brought on, you know, uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce or Katy Perry or Lena Dunham 
to to sing or speak or whatever they do. It's just this is not going to help you win elections. You have a large swath of voters in your base who care about policy, who care about winning. And even if you just ran a single ad this entire election cycle saying, vote for me and I will replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that alone will be so much more persuasive than whatever that was. It was cringeworthy, it was awful, and I wish I could unsee it, and I'm sure that you wish you could unsee it, but I'm sorry, if I saw that, you're gonna suffer with me, viewer. I'm sorry, but that's the way it's gotta be. That was awful. <laughs> So I want to talk about some people, a select portion of the Democratic Party's base, who think that they're doing something to help out the left, but in actuality, they're not really helping out the left. There's a number of people who are aggressively lobbying Joe Biden to choose Elizabeth Warren as his running mate, because in their view, that would be a concession to the left. And let me just put all doubts aside, Elizabeth Warren is no concession to the left at all. In fact, if Joe Biden chose her as his running mate, um, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, that would mean nothing to the left because she's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt she stands for absolutely nothing. So I'm not delusional enough to believe that she would try to, you know, nudge Joe Biden in the right direction. No, she would just go along with whatever he wanted because Elizabeth Warren is a team player, party above people. She's proven that time and again. And if you haven't learned that about her nature by now, then I, I don't know what to tell you. She's too far gone. She's irredeemable. And in 2024, I think that the left should, if there's someone available, attempt to primary her. It most likely won't be successful, but it still is something that we should try to do because I think we deserve better. We deserve to have someone that represents the left unequivocally, not conditionally based on whether or not it's convenient, right? So one of the people who has been pushing for Elizabeth Warren to be VP is uh, the insufferable Mehdi Hassan, who penned an open letter to Joe Biden saying that he should definitely pick her as a running mate because that would appease the left. And he also tweeted this. Uh, All the polling makes it pretty clear. If Joe Biden is genuine about reaching out to the left, to progressives, and to, yes, Bernie Sanders voters, he should make Elizabeth Warren his running mate. If he doesn't, we know he's not serious. Now, apparently, he needs some type of sign that (laughs) will tell us whether or not Joe Biden is uh, serious or not. He's not serious. But I mean, I just, I don't understand this. What do you expect Elizabeth Warren to do in terms of like helping the left? Nothing, nothing. And this is one thing that's really bothering me. Um, if you're going to vote for Joe Biden strategically in a swing state because you desperately want to oust Donald Trump, I can rationalize your choice to vote strategically. But don't lie about what we're going to get. Because the left isn't going to get a victory with Joe Biden. The one benefit is if we defeat Donald Trump, Donald Trump is defeated. And uh, in turn, Joe Biden will most likely be the one who replaces Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But that's it. I mean, any other benefit, like uh, not going to war with Iran, well, we just wait four to eight years until a more competent Republican comes along and uh, actually does what Trump wants to do. Um, undoing all of Trump's disgusting executive orders. That'd be great temporarily, but we just know that, you know, the next Republican is going to come along and undo all the progress that you've made. And then the next Democrat after that subsequently won't undo the harm caused by, you know, the Republican Party. For example, Donald Trump moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And Joe Biden says, you know, I don't agree with this, although I wouldn't move it back. So, I mean, do you understand? We keep lurching further and further to the right. And until we get a true revolutionary who's going to undo some of the institutional mechanisms in some way that is leading us to our ruin, both economically and when it comes to the environment, then we're not going to get real change. So we have to be real about ourselves. If you're voting for Joe Biden, I respect that. If you want to defeat Donald Trump, that's that's fine. I want Donald Trump to be gone. Because I don't want another four years of Donald Trump, but I'm not under this delusional idea in my mind that we're going to be able to put pressure on him. Of course, that's not going to happen. He's not going to listen to us when he's in office, because if he was going to listen to us, don't you think he'd be listening to us right now when he needs our votes? So just keep that in mind. Like We have to be realistic. 
and temper our expectations. Defeating Trump is important, but let's not delude ourselves into thinking that we'll have any sway over Joe Biden whatsoever, because he's not going to listen to the left. He's going to listen to his donors in the same way that Obama and Clinton and any other corporate Democrat listens to their donors, right? And that's that. And, you know, as uh, Matt Leck put it, if Warren is the pick, it'll be for services rendered, not because it's a real concession to the left. Exactly. It's not a real concession to the left. And I don't think that Joe Biden would pick Elizabeth Warren. I just don't. Wall Street doesn't want him to pick Elizabeth Warren, and he'll likely listen to Wall Street. Now, I'd be happy to be proven wrong, but it doesn't matter. Like, even Wall Street doesn't like someone as, you know, a milk toast as Elizabeth Warren because, you know, she know they know that she'll scold them, you know, uh, during a public hearing at best, at maximum. That's as far as she'll go. But they don't even want that. They want a corporate Democrat like Gretchen Whitmer, you know, so that's who I'm sure he'll gravitate towards. If not her, then that type of Democrat. But the problem with this line of thinking that Elizabeth Warren should be the VP is that people are outraged that others don't think the same way. So, for example, there's an article that came out about how Bernie Sanders isn't necessarily advising Joe Biden about who should be his running mate. He's kind of just ignoring that discussion altogether, and people are not happy with him because of this. So, as Tal Axelrod of The Hill reports, Senator Bernie Sanders has thus far not encouraged former Vice President Joe Biden's team to consider Senator Elizabeth Warren as his running mate, despite his longstanding ideological alliance with the Massachusetts senator. There is no ideological alliance, by the way. Three people familiar with Sanders' conversations with Biden, whom the Vermont lawmaker has endorsed, told The Washington Post that Sanders has declined to back some liberals' efforts to convince the former Vice president to select Warren as his number two. A top spokesperson for the Sanders campaign told The Hill that the senator and his team are not advising the Biden campaign's vice presidential selection process in any way, shape, or form. So basically, people are viewing this as Bernie Sanders snubbing Elizabeth Warren because um, he's not actively campaigning for her to be Joe Biden's running mate. And as the Washington Post's Matt Viser put it, Bernie Sanders, the liberal figure best positioned to push for concessions from Biden, so far has declined to support Elizabeth Warren as VP despite their ideological alliance, according to three people familiar with his conversations with Biden. Um, okay, Bernie Sanders doesn't owe Elizabeth Warren shit and stop trying to pretend like there's some ideological alliance. If there was an ideological alliance, maybe Elizabeth Warren wouldn't have tried to sink him before Iowa. Maybe she would have endorsed him after Super Tuesday. Now, I'm not saying that if she had endorsed him, then that would have led to him being successful, but at least it would have showed that she's principled for once in her life. But there is no ideological alliance. Elizabeth Warren is a reformer. She wants to make tweaks around the edges, whereas Bernie Sanders is more of a revolutionary. He wants to change the system fundamentally from top to bottom. And while I don't agree with him on everything, I at least acknowledge that there is a real substantive difference between him and Elizabeth Warren. I mean, Elizabeth Warren didn't even get elected, and she already backtracked on Medicare for All. She acquiesced and supported a public option. That's unacceptable. So, you're not a revolutionary, you're not an ideological ally to us if you're caving before you even get into the White House? No. So, it just, it irritates me that people are trying to, I don't know, create some type of momentum for Elizabeth Warren as if that'd make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. Look, I don't care who Joe Biden picks as his running mate. I genuinely don't, unless it's someone like uh, Nina Turner or Bernie Sanders, like an actual Sanders ally. And I know that that's not going to happen, but the reason why I don't care is because I don't necessarily think they're going to have an influence on him. Joe Biden's running mate matters insofar as that will likely be the next, you know, neoliberal that we're going to have to deal with in four to eight years. Someone who we will inevitably have to fight. Whoever he picks, it's probably going to be someone who's shitty. And it just, it doesn't matter to me, right? So let's not pretend like there's anything we can do if you consider yourself to be left-leaning to influence Joe Biden. Again, I want Donald Trump to lose. I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden, but just make the argument that is the relevant argument. The only benefit to Joe Biden assuming power and ousting Trump, at least temporarily, 
is to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like, in terms of getting any robust agenda passed into law, whatever he passes will mostly be done via executive order and undone by the next Republican administration. So, I mean, like, we have to be realistic because if we lie to people, if we gaslight people, and, you know, we give them a skewed perception of the power that they actually have, they're not going to use it properly. Like, people need to know what they have, you know, what tools they can use at their disposal to actually affect change. And getting Joe Biden to bend to the will of the left, um, that's just not going to happen. Like, he'd do it hell. He'd already offer you concessions when he needs your vote. But if you think he's going to be more inclined to listen to you when he's in power, when he doesn't need your vote, I mean... That's just naivete, and I get that people want something to hang on to because the you know future looks really bleak right now, but we've got to be honest with ourselves if we truly want to change the country, and trying to you know place our hope in a Joe Biden administration I think is misguided. If he wins and beats Trump, then hopefully he can replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but that's really the best that we can get out of Joe Biden's administration. That's it, period. So, you know... This idea that Elizabeth Warren as VP would somehow fundamentally change what Joe Biden would bring us politically, it's delusional, and it's not going to happen. So if you are one of the individuals pushing for Elizabeth Warren to be VP, fine, whatever, like, that's fine. But don't try to, you know, um, basically scold others as Matt Pfizer did to Bernie Sanders and get them to agree with your delusional idea that that's going to make a difference. It's not going to make a difference. Elizabeth Warren as VP will absolutely do nothing for the left because she is not operating on behalf of the left. She's loyal to party leadership and she's proven that time and again. I don't know what else she needs to do. Does she need to put it in writing for you that she's not fighting for you? She doesn't care about the left? Like what more do you want from her? Actions matter. And her actions throughout the course of not just the 2020 primary, but the 2016 primary show you beyond a shadow of a doubt that she has no spine. So it doesn't matter if she's the running mate. Joe Biden will still be Joe Biden, the pro-corporate neoliberal warmonger we've always known him as. And Elizabeth Warren as his running mate definitely is not going to change that. Stop fooling yourselves. So I'm going to blow your minds right now because a lot of people don't know that previously I was a Democratic Party loyalist. I was one of the Kool-Aid drinkers. Like in 2014, I was part of that nerdy draft war and campaign. And I've said this before, but a lot of people don't know that. But, you know, I believed that not everyone, I was still critical of the Democratic Party and largely dissatisfied with Obama. But I did believe that overall, most Democrats wanted to do good. And to them, it wasn't just necessarily about getting power. Um, and protecting the status quo. Like, I thought that people within the Democratic Party, like Elizabeth Warren, actually wanted to affect change. Um, and that's why I wanted her to be president over Hillary Clinton. Because even when I was a Democratic Party Kool-Aid drinker, I at least acknowledged that the party was too right-leaning. And I thought that people like Elizabeth Warren had the courage to, you know, take the party in a new direction. But looking at the 2020 Democratic Party primary... It's just almost unfathomable how different my perception is now because this election really was mask off for Democrats because they're proving that almost none of them believe in anything. I mean, you have a couple people who I think are actually left-leaning and want to affect change in the country, but overall, most Democrats are proving that they really don't stand for anything. It's party above people. They're going to be with their team. It doesn't matter how foolish and hypocritical they look. It's the Democratic Party. And if you don't love them and worship them, then um, fuck you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. So let me just use Elizabeth Warren as an example because she was someone who I respected so much. So back in 2018, when I was trying to put aside my feelings of disappointment in her after she refused to endorse Bernie Sanders in 2016, you know, she said this about Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. And when she said this at the time, I genuinely was foolish enough to believe her. Yesterday was an extraordinary day when a woman came forward to make heartfelt claims about something terrible 
that had happened to her. The man in question could stand up and behave as if he is entitled to this position and launch a political attack and simply declare that, no, it's not true. We have to acknowledge what's going on in our country is wrong and it does not represent our values. What we should be celebrating is the fact that we are willing to fight back. We are willing to raise our voices. We are willing to say we will be heard in this country. So I loved what she said there. You know, uh, Brett Kavanaugh seemed entitled to the position. I noticed that as well. You know, women uh, will be heard in this country. Of course, that's something that is absolutely necessary. And she went a little bit further in a tweet saying, I still believe Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, this was a year later in 2019, and like the man who appointed him, Brett Kavanaugh should be impeached. So think about how strong her condemnation of Brett Kavanaugh is. The allegations brought forward by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford are so serious that she literally believes a sitting Supreme Court justice should be impeached. That is a very strong statement. And it's part of the reason why, even after I kind of saw that Elizabeth Warren didn't have as solid of a spine as I had previously thought, she still is willing to go a little bit further than other Democrats, at least rhetorically. But contrast that with what she's saying today. When it comes to arguably more serious allegations brought forward against Joe Biden by Tara Reid, with even more corroborating support than Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, well, she's no longer saying what she said. All that sentiment about believing women has gone out the window because as Alexander Bolton of The Hill writes, Senator Elizabeth Warren told reporters late Monday that she found presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden's denial of sexual assault allegations by a former Senate aide credible and convincing. I believe that everyone has a right to tell her story, to be listened to and treated with respect, Warren told reporters after she walked into the Capitol for a late afternoon vote. Quote, I saw the reports of what Miss Reed said. I saw the interview with Vice President Biden. I appreciate that the Vice President took a lot of questions, tough questions, and that he answered them directly and respectfully. The progressive senator also said the Vice President's answers were credible and convincing. Later, asked if she thinks an independent investigation into Reed's claims, something a couple other Democratic senators have endorsed, is needed. Warren said, I think what the Vice President has said is convincing and I support him. So do you understand how troubling this is? In 2019, she was willing to go further than most Democrats in calling for Brett Kavanaugh to be impeached. And now she won't even go as far as other Democrats who have signed on to an independent investigation into Tara Reid's claims which, if he's innocent, is harmless. She stands for absolutely nothing. Maybe when she was first elected, she actually was idealistic. She actually did want to make a difference. But now it's really clear what Liz Elizabeth Warren is all about. Elizabeth Warren. She wants power by any means necessary, and when asked whether or not she would be Joe Biden's running mate, um, for the first time ever, she answered the question directly without meandering and bringing in, you know, um, her family history. She just simply said, yes. We have seen the importance of having a leader that we can count on in a crisis. It's not Donald Trump. It is Joe Biden. If he asked you to be his running mate, would you say yes? Yes. She cares about power. Elizabeth Warren cares about power. And she will throw away everything she previously stood for if that's going to get her closer to the power that she so desperately craves. You know what they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you don't necessarily even have to get power to let it corrupt you. Just being in the vicinity of power, that's enough to corrupt you and turn you into... The same type of ghoul who she used to fight against, or at least 
I think she used to fight against. Maybe that was all political theater. Who knows at this point? But Elizabeth Warren is an absolute clown, and nobody should take her seriously. Nobody should take her seriously after this election cycle. And look, you don't even have to go back that far. You don't have to go back to 2019. There are examples in 2020 of her saying that basically we have no reason not to believe women. Take a look at what she said about Mike Bloomberg when she was asked about whether or not, you know, she believes the women who Mike Bloomberg is refusing to release from non-disclosure agreements. This is what she said. She was very clear. So much, Brian. Do you believe that the former mayor of New York said that to a pregnant employee? Well, a pregnant employee sure said that he did. Why shouldn't I believe her? You know, I'm just really tired of this world. This one is personal for me. It really is. But you Pregnancy believe that back, you believe he's that kind of person real. who did that. Look, pregnancy discrimination yeah, I... is real. And these we have gone on and on and on where people say, oh, I can't really believe the woman. Really? Why not? So you say that you believe Joe Biden and you don't believe Tara Reid. My question to you now, Liz, is really? Why not? Why can't you believe Tara Reid? Have you not seen the countless photos and videos of Joe Biden touching women, sniffing their hair, invading their personal space? Have you not heard from Lucy Flores as well as the other women who said that he made them feel uncomfortable? Is it really that difficult to believe Tara Reid? I think that I would respect her more if she just said, look, I believe Tara Reid and I think Joe Biden probably did what um, what she says he did. That's hard for me to say as a very loyal Democrat, but I believe women. So I believe Tara Reid. However, I'm still going to support Joe Biden. And yes, I would still be his VP because it would at least show some level of you know consistency. Because you're not going to get the VP anyway. Like, you made a fool of yourself in 2016 when Hillary Clinton dragged you along because she made you think you'd get the VP position, and you didn't. So you're doing that again, and you didn't learn. So, I mean, one of two things, if not both things, are true about Elizabeth Warren. Either she has the worst political instincts ever, or she has no spine. I think it's probably both. But, I mean, this is just, how could you not see this? And let me just say, everyone is human. Nobody is perfectly consistent. I try my very best to be consistent, but I'm sure that if you go back in the Humanist Report catalog, you could see some in inconsistencies with what I've said now, in spite of the fact that I try very hard to be consistent. But I'll admit, you know, we're not perfect beings. We're flawed. Human beings are inherently flawed. And oftentimes, you know, our ideologies and opinions change with life experience. So, you know, maybe that leads to greater inconsistency. But this is brazen. She's going back on things she said last year. How are you not embarrassed? How can you with a straight face defend Joe Biden after all of the things you just said, all of the powerful statements you said about believing women just recently? I just, they have no shame. And they think that they can pretend like everything is okay and that... Voters are going to forget about this, but they're not going to forget. This is precisely why so many people don't vote. They just check out of electoral politics because it's all a fucking show. Nobody stands for anything. Nobody means what they say. Everyone in D.C. is just jockeying for a better position of power. That's it. Nobody gives a flying fuck about getting any policies implemented. That's why so many fucking people check out. That's why so many people who I know who were excited to come out and vote have just kind of thrown their hands up and said, fuck it, what's the point? Nobody believes in anything. It doesn't matter. None of it matters. It's all a show. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I believe that everyone should vote. I believe we have to use the tools that we have to make our voices heard loud and clear. So we should vote. Come out and vote. But you have to at least understand why people are so demoralized. It's because of things like this. People who previously used to inspire voters make them think that the system was working because people like Elizabeth Warren could get into the Senate. Now they're leading to, you know, it being delegitimized and they're not trying to do anything to redeem it. They're not even 
paying lip service to the fact that we're so disappointed. Like, we're all just supposed to put aside all the negative things that Elizabeth Warren and Beto O'Rourke and Kamala Harris and Cory Booker said about Joe Biden. And now we're supposed to believe that they believe that he's the best person ever. And, you know, they uh, love the fact that he's the nominee. You're so fake. And I hate this. This is why people tune out of politics. Because of shit like this. Elizabeth Warren is no help. So, I mean, I used to think that she was one of the better ones, but now she's absolutely part of the problem. This brazen lack of consistency and just open hypocrisy. I, I don't know how they're not ashamed to look themselves in the mirrors. How does Elizabeth Warren live with herself? And she said that Bernie's base was built on a foundation of hate. Yeah. Your base is built on a foundation of bullshit. And it stinks so bad, I could smell it across the country. You may be in D.C., but we know you stand for nothing. You're a phony, Elizabeth Warren. You're a hack. You put party above people. And you should really just stop because you're embarrassing yourself. Hello everyone, I am back with Joy Marie, otherwise known as Savage Joy. She's an activist, she hosts her own podcast on Real Progressives, and she is here to kind of reflect what we all just went through and what we're going through currently. Joy, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me. These discussions are basically incredibly therapeutic to me and you know based on what the audience says they always love these because you know i think that it's okay if we admit that we don't always know the right words to say during tough times we don't always have the answers sometimes we don't have direction but if we just talk i think that that kind of goes a long way and we just need a good you know conversation right now um because we all have been going through a lot um, so I want to uh, just tease a little something. Uh, Joy has a pretty big announcement about a project that she's working on. We're not going to reveal that until the very end. So you have to watch the entire video. No fast forwarding. OK, um, so watch that. And <laughs> and I'm not preggers. I, just as a as a heads up, I am not preggers. She maybe is pregnant. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm too old. I'll be 41 in two weeks. I'm not even going there. <laughs> Well, happy birthday in advance. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to get your opinion because out of all the people I know who supports Bernie Sanders, nobody was more dedicated and invested than you. You literally like sacrificed five weeks of your life to go to Iowa and knock on doors for Bernie Sanders. And this is tough. Like you just mentioned before we went on that you got your ballot. I know my ballot is sitting in my mailbox. I haven't even checked yet because I, I don't want to. Um, so... Let's just check in. How are you doing? Um, I'm I'm pretty heartbroken still. Um, you know, it's it's I would say it's 2016 all over again, but it's not. It's worse because it's like the second time. Um, so there's kind of this PTSD of of sorts with this, you know, the death of democracy again. Um, yeah, so I, I went to Iowa, I left my family, and I knew one person in the entire state. I had never been there, um, and I went for five weeks and, um, you know, knocked on hundreds of doors and ice and snow and, um, like, negative four degrees and, um, you know, just made thousands of phone calls. Um, and, I and you know, I was there caucus night and everything helping and I was so envious of everyone who was getting to vote, you know, um, caucus, but, you know, to vote. And I was like, I can't wait to get back to Pennsylvania and start, you know, being active there for our primary. Um, and I came back, they made me victory captain. And, you know, so I was going to be training people, things like that, um, on how to do phone banking and such. Unfortunately, uh, a connection I have in the campaign let me know the Sunday before uh, Bernie dropped that he was going to be dropping. And it was devastating um, because, you know, uh, I still had scheduled trainings the next three days. 
Um, and I am extremely dedicated and they were like, why can't you do it? You know? And I was like, I'm just not feeling like I can convince people to vote for him right now. And stuff like that. And, and, you know, I still haven't watched uh, the video where Bernie dropped. I can't, like, I don't want to see it. All I know is he dropped. That's all I want to know. That's all I care about. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to see him, um, you know, because I know it was hard for him. I know, but uh, you know, it's as someone who has given, you know, so much to this campaign emotionally and physically and, monetarily and and things like that i absolutely feel a sense of betrayal um did i expect him to take it to convention again you're damn right i did um you know covid fucked everything i mean let's keep it real it fucked everything and maybe he'd still be in the race if it wasn't for covid but he dropped too early now all the states are mail and ballot So it's not like that's, you know, uh, putting people at risk necessarily because we can all vote by mail. Um, So he he just dropped way too prematurely. um, And and it's it's hurtful. And today I got my ballot, which I've been waiting for for over a year finally got it and i had like a full on ugly cry when i you know <laughs> checked that box because i'm like here's you know it's all coming to fruition here it is it's a culmination of everything i gave my life for but it's not the same because he's not going to be president now there's no hope of that it's done he's 78 he's not running again it's done where the hell do we go from here? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I'm like a lot of people. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I genuinely don't know. I feel like a lot of anger. I feel in some ways energized, but also, you know, uh, demoralized. And I don't know where to take, you know, the, the, the energy, the anger, and place it next. Like, all of this can't just dissipate into thin air. Like, it has to go somewhere. We have to channel it. But right now, I don't think anybody really has a clear-cut solution because movements, you know, I I don't necessarily think that they hinge entirely on a leader, but it really helps to have a leader, to have a face. I mean, part of the reason why I truly believe Occupy wasn't successful is because it was a leaderless movement. There was no hierarchy, and there are benefits to that. But at the same time, you know, if you don't have someone kind of guiding and steering the movement in a way... It really is difficult to maintain. So my number one goal is just to make sure that the whole crew stays together. Like this energy for Medicare for all and, you know, all these things that Bernie Sanders brought to the forefront. It's not going to just go away. So we have to make sure that the team stays together to continue fighting. But in terms of how we continue that fight, I genuinely don't know. And I, I agree with you. I was really, really, um, I was saddened when he dropped out. He did drop out too early. And in a way, I don't necessarily know if this is just because, you know, I still feel admittedly emotional because of all of this. I kind of resent Bernie in a way. Like, I don't hate Bernie, but I feel angry because it feels like we all poured so much into this, our hearts and souls, time, energy, resources. And I just feel like he didn't fight hard enough. And You know, I, from the beginning, have been saying you've got to be tougher. You've got to hit Joe Biden. And he never did. But at the same time, you know, I can rationalize his decision to not hit Joe Biden because his his strategy was working. He was leading in the polls. Right. So it wasn't necessarily something that I thought was sinking his campaign until after Super Tuesday. That was a different race. And at that point in time, Bernie needed to really look in the mirror and ask himself if he truly wants to win. And I never thought that he did that. He changed nothing. And he just ran the same campaign, which we all knew wasn't going to be successful. So to me, I feel hurt because it seems like he just kind of surrendered. Like he put up the white flag and like, I get it, right? Like I can't expect someone who's 78 years old to sacrifice their time and energy if he doesn't really feel like it's going nowhere. But at the same time, you know, I I still like we all kind of we put everything into that campaign our hopes and dreams and this isn't like here's the thing and like there's a lot of people who love that the bernie bros are all demoralized and whatnot but this isn't like a sports team losing to us like to me this was so important that i felt like 
if Bernie wasn't elected, humanity doesn't have a chance. And what I mean by that is if Bernie got elected, he was the only person who I believed would actually fight to get action when it comes to climate change and lead the world. And I wasn't even, you know, um, under this illusion that he would be successful. I just felt like he would give us a chance, right? He wasn't a savior. He's a human being who was very influential, but not perfect. Um, and now that he's gone, I just, I don't know what to, what to think of this, right? Like who's next? What can we do? Um, there, and, and the answer is there's, there's no one. No one's ready to step up. Nobody has the credibility or name recognition to step up. Nobody is as bold as Bernie Sanders. And it's not like Bernie was this god who was infallible. He was very flawed as a candidate. He made a lot of mistakes that I feel uh, frustrated by. But in terms of like anyone who's near his level, there's no one. So I kind of feel like, you know, we're all just flailing. We don't, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know how to make what has been created a sustained movement. And it's a little bit disheartening. And in a way, I feel like maybe after COVID-19 is, you know, when we could put that behind us, maybe things will become a little bit more clear because I kind of feel like myself and others just have tunnel vision. We just want to get through this right now. Um, but it's tough. And I, I think that the lack of direction, it is, it's hard. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on some of the re revelations that we have that kind of added to my anger with Bernie Sanders. I shouldn't say anger. Like, I don't know if I'm angry at him. I just like, I'm giving him the cold shoulder, you know, if I were speaking to him currently. Um, we yeah, learned he and I are, are separated right now. <laughs> we're not divorced, but we're separated. <laughs> we need couples therapy, like 100%. Um, yes, yes. Well, we learned about Jeff Weaver starting a super PAC and how everyone within the campaign, they knew about Jeff Weaver. Now, I was an outsider. I didn't know about Jeff Weaver. And, you know, some of the signs that we saw back in 2016 or 2017 with the revolt of the Our Revolution staffers. What do you make of this? Because to me, I thought Bernie knew better than to surround himself with people like Jeff Weaver. Can you just kind of share your thoughts? Because this really, it pissed me off. Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, you know, being so connected to the campaign, I will be totally transparent. I did know that Weaver, Baz, and um, Chuck Rocha were very not well-liked, to put it that way. Um I, I met Jeff Weaver and I actually interviewed him um, a year ago, um, or 18 it was, um, and he's quite charming. Um, he was very nice and personable and um, encouraging and, and it came across very, very genuine. Um, now, the thing about Bernie, which I've heard from his own family members, is he is loyal to a fault. You're friends with him. You're nice to him. My friend Joe, you know, that is Bernie. When he puts his hand on Liz Warren's back, I want to grab his shoulders and shake him. <laughs> but to him, she he's still loyal to her, even though she's garbage to him. And that's how he was with Jeff Weaver. They've he, Jeff has worked for him for 32 years. So that at that point, it becomes like, a family member you know and and you know i mean that's the only uh job jeff has known has been working for bernie and i think bernie had that sense of obligation in a way um but since you know faz took jeff's place a lot of us were like okay good someone new's getting in there and then we started learning how the campaign staff was calling him Spaz um, as as his nickname. And uh, Chuck Rocha, I was told, was, you know, very shady, but he seems so nice and, and intelligent and for the movement. And, you know, the thing is, I wanted to say, you know, a number of things I, you know, was told by higher ups on the campaign, but it would have hurt Bernie. Yeah. So, you know, someone from WAPO sees my show and says, ooh, Bernie's campaign, you know, manager is like conspiring against him. And next thing you know, I fucking screw Bernie, you know, out of votes. So I didn't want to go there, but I was apprehensive and it was um, a frustration by 
a lot of people on the campaign. Um, yeah, so it's it's difficult. I am not surprised in the least that they created this pack. Nobody is. No one. That's interesting. Bernie. That's so interesting. And, you know, like you said, he's loyal to a fault. And I think that that's admirable, but it's not admirable when it reaches a point where it's literally harmful. You know, it, it goes back to the Joe Biden is my friend thing. You can't say that. Like, this is not a good person. This is someone who has voted for a war that has killed hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million Iraqis. This isn't a good person. And that's not to say that Bernie is perfect or would be a perfect president. But, you know, to me, it's just a blind spot. And I kind of viewed it as naivete on Bernie's part because you can see the good in people. I think that that's, that's great. You know, I, I love optimism. I At my core, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person. But at some point, you know, that instinct, that mechanism that, you know, tells you to kind of be skeptical, it's got to kick in. And I feel like it never kicked in for Bernie Sanders. Um, and we, you know, we just saw, what was it, last week, he did a live stream with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, how can you, do, she just, right, she just said that your campaign was built on a foundation of hate, I'm paraphrasing, but like attacking yeah. all of Bernie Sanders supporters, like to me, that is unforgivable, like you know what this movement is about. I don't, like, I personally, Bernie's just a vessel. I want policies. Give me policies, and I'll shut up and go away. Give me Medicare for all, and the wars. These are, like, very simple things that we want. So to say that that's motivated by a foundation of hate, he should have called her out publicly for this. Some things are just beyond the pale, and what she did to try to sink him, that's not what friends do. That's not what friends do, you know, if you're genuinely a friend. Like, the way that Joe Biden treated him, uh, Joe Biden's characters are finding out about the sexual assault allegations. At some point, you've got to reevaluate who you're friends with and realize if they're kind of bringing you down. And I just feel like Bernie never did that. And I don't want people to think I'm against Bernie and I'm just dogging on Bernie. But I do think that if we want to be successful at anything going forward... We have to be introspective and we have to ask these tough questions because Bernie is not a cult leader. And I think that the mainstream media is surprised how, you know, we are able to criticize him so easily after they called us a cult for two years or four years. Um, but I mean, I want to be successful and I want the policies that I advocate for to be codified into law one day. So we have to kind of look ourselves in the mirror and ask, where did we go wrong? Um, and this is kind of what I wanted to pick your brain about because I think that there's a lot of things that Bernie could have done better. But at the same time, I think that there are also things that are kind of outside of our control. I don't think there's anything that he could have done to rein in the media bias. He could have maybe called it out more. I don't know that that would have helped. But just within the realm of things that we can control, what do you think, if you were advising Bernie, you would have told him to do? And just in your opinion, this is loaded. You might not have an answer. What do you think is the number one thing that led to his demise? Um, I kind of have a theory, but I want to hear what you have to say so we can compare notes. Um, two things I think uh, which led to us losing votes are A, Joe Biden's my friend, and B, yes, I believe he can win against Trump. Yeah. Never say that about your opponent. First of all, it's not true. He can't win against Trump. We all know this. Biden's going to lose. If they don't, you know, if they keep him in there, he will lose. We will have Trump again. That's a fact. So the fact that Bernie was like, yes, I can, you know, and he kept saying it. No, Bernie, shut up. Say, I believe I'm the only one who can win. Because then he would say, um, you know, I don't think status quo can win against Trump. I don't think big money can win against Trump. Yeah, I believe Joe can beat him. No, dude, he can't. So I think, you know, when people are watching this and they're undecided, yeah, even Bernie said Joe can beat Trump. No, he can't. So I think he played it way too soft. I mean, in 2016, we were like, go harder on Hillary. She's garbage, you know, but he went harder on her than he did on Joe. Yeah. I mean, the, the one... um uh debate when he was like i'm gonna ask you a third time did you say you'd cut social security i was like yes finally let's go bernie yes 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 and then it was one night only he stopped it was like no i finally thought you were gonna like go hard like it was 
I don't know, you know, what was said or what was done. I don't know. All I know is I keep thinking back to um, in 2018 when I um, interviewed um, Jeff Weaver and he had just come out with this book and he was telling me about how, and I do believe him on this. I really do. Um, because we had a lengthy discussion about how psychologically and mentally it affected Bernie so much when Trump won because he did partially feel responsible. I mean, he was in a place nobody else in the world was in. And he's in that place, he's in that place again. He's being held to make all of his bros fall in line, which we're not going to, but he's being held to that expectation. Um, and we cannot truly fathom what that's like for him. And that's not to rationalize or make excuses. That is just literally um, the case. He does feel a very big sense of responsibility to get Trump out of office um, because he knows he's being blamed for him being in it in the first place. And when countless people say that, it kind of fucks with your head and you're like, maybe I did kind of help. We all knew he didn't, um, but I, I get it. He has that, that sense of responsibility that none of us can comprehend. Um, as far as, you know, complaining about the media and stuff, that to me is kind of hopeless just because when Trump does it, people flip out. Oh, it's like a Nazi. You're saying, you know, the media is awful and, um, you know, and, and Bernie came out with an article that said he thinks the media is one of the reasons he lost and it just was not good. Um, so I think really just the main things were, well, and also, uh, you know, he, he, um, he took on Iowa for the in inconsistencies. What about Massachusetts? What about Texas? What about you winning California and not getting delegates for over a month? Why aren't you saying these things? Like us as volunteers worked for these votes. We worked for these delegates. We deserve them. So the fact that you're not saying, you know, as a campaign, we have every right to say, you know what? Our exit polls show not only did we win, we won by far, and now we're coming in like third, you know what I mean? It just, it wasn't making sense. Um, so yes, we could have taken, uh, taken on um, individual states more as well. I feel like after Iowa, he wouldn't have been unreasonable to request an audit of every single primary after that. I mean, that's something that was unprecedented. We've never seen anything like that. And I don't necessarily know that there's anything there with the exit polls. Um, I know that they oversample younger people. But at the same time, when we saw what happened with Iowa, like I was already calling for, you know, some type of international organization to oversee our elections because you can, like you can't. Here's the thing. Regardless of the outcome, you can't have people lose faith in the process. And one thing that's become abundantly clear is that nobody trusts the process. You can't have a democracy if people don't trust the process because then, you know, they don't actually feel like their votes mean anything. And when people check out of democracy, democracy dies. And I'm not saying that to be hyperbolic. I'm saying, like, comparatively speaking, in these types of countries, mostly younger democracies, when people check out and stop voting, they end up dying or they slide into illiberalism or authoritarianism. So, I mean, the people who claim to care about democracy, they're not taking this seriously. You know, um, even just the fact that we have 100 million people that don't vote, that is a huge, huge red flag. It doesn't bode well for, you know, the long term strength of our democracy and nobody's taking it seriously. So, um, yeah, I, you know, one thing to me and I'm I'm not 100 percent sure that this is like the smoking gun, the one thing that led to Bernie losing. And I think that he could have made some um, adjustments afterwards. But I think that after South Carolina, Obama getting everyone to kind of coalesce around Joe Biden, that really did have a substantial effect. And I, I can't remember who conducted the study, but they showed like the differences between the left and centrist is that they really respect party figures, Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, like these people, they say something and it's like gospel, whereas the left obviously isn't like that. You know, we're like, fuck the authority. Um, so when Obama got everyone to coalesce, like when everyone kind of dropped out behind the scenes, we all knew it was Obama and endorsed, you know, Joe Biden. 
that was huge. It changed the entire dynamic of the race. And I think that largely that is one of the biggest things that led to Bernie's loss. I, I can't say like it's too soon to say that's definitely what did it. But it was one of the factors oh, no, unquestionably. I agree. Yeah. If they if those all those people stayed in, vote would have kept being split. I mean, that is absolutely the number one reason. Mathematically, a hundred percent. It's um it's as soon as they dropped out, that's when okay, you have two candidates. That's it. You know, before you had six. Well, they go different ways. Well, now you have two. And unfortunately, Biden voters, their second choice was Bernie. I never believed that until I was at a caucus site in Iowa and Joe Biden was not viable in my location. And the majority of them came to me That's in crazy. my section, which was insane. I'm like, they're so different. Yeah, they're both like old white dudes, but like they couldn't be more different. Um, yeah, it was crazy. So being given, you know, people have Obama nostalgia. That's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. They want obama number three. Oh, we miss him so much oh my god handsome well spoken and they ignore you know all the horrible things he's done um and joe is just kind of like an extension of going back to normal which anyone with a brain knows that uh for people of color and and you know women and lgbtq like going back to normal is not good um so, you know, it's a lot of it is privilege, a lot of it. Like, I don't care about, you know, policy. Joe Biden has no policy. Right. What does he stand for? I don't fucking know. I have That's no idea. No phone bankers. What are you going to do? Call someone? And then they're like, what do you say about how does he feel about health care? I mean, he doesn't like Medicare for all. Like, that. No, what does he support? <laughs> How do you, and also, how do you phone bank and answer, like, what about Tara Reid? What about the Iraq war? Like, how? That's why nobody, I want them to call me so bad. <laughs> like, so bad. I'm like, please call me. Because um, I I would probably uh, make them cry. But um, <laughs> it would kind of be worth it. Um, it would. Yeah, it would. I, I think we're we're pretty fucked, uh, to be honest. But not that I support them just doing a switcheroo and putting in like an idiot like Cuomo who hasn't done a single event or gotten a, a single, you know, uh, delegate, because that is also the epitome of undemocratic. Uh, but Joey himself even said the VP I pick needs to be ready to step up immediately. Why? It's like he knows they're going to pull the 25th Amendment on him. And mm -hmm. he's sending Jill out for him, things like that. It's I think he knows. I, I really do. I think he knows like he cannot, you know, cognitively deal with anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, my feelings are kind of all over the place on that because it's like to my core, I have to be consistent. And if Joe Biden got more votes, all right. You know, no matter how he got those votes, he gets to be the nominee. That's just fair is fair, right? I mean, I was I was very angry when we were leading and there was all this talk of Bernie Sanders having it stolen away from him at the convention with superdelegates. Liz Warren even said that she would be open to this, right? Um, so I, I think that if you get the most votes, that's fine. That being said, I'm not going to shed a tear for Joe Biden if there is a switcheroo that happens at the convention. I don't think that will happen. I'm not going to shed a tear for him because he was advocating the same thing. I mean, I keep pointing to an article on my show about how Joe Biden says that if somebody gets a plurality, Bernie Sanders, but not a majority, he will uh, aggressively compete for the nomination at the convention, which means he was willing to resort to a contested convention. So, I mean, you're the one who asked for this. You said that, you know, contested convention is A-OK -okay if it's to stop Bernie. So now you reap what you sow. You're kind of a horrible candidate, you know. And there's the Tara Reid allegation. Sorry, I believe her. Anyone who doesn't is, I think, fooling themselves. Um, and it's just, like you said, we're fucked. <laughs> I don't think that you can put it more simply. And it's it's so, so frustrating. And it's got to be like a slap in the face to activists, especially yourself, how Joe Biden won states he didn't set foot in when Bernie supporters were relentless, phone banking every fucking minute that they had to spare. And this asshole won by doing nothing. 
by standing for nothing. Like, I'm reminded of this video, I think it was after Iowa, where some of his volunteers took turns sharing, like, 50 things that they liked about Joe Biden or 30 things. Yes! And none of them had policies. I, I saw like two policies maybe. And it was like, oh, he's nice. He's committed. It's like, none of this means anything. Joe Biden says there's nothing that we can't accomplish together. But then he says we can never have Medicare for all. Like this man, he doesn't stand for anything. It's so irritating to me. So it feels like, you know, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. Like, I know Democrats like to pretend Trump is uniquely terrible. And sure, maybe he is with regard to tone. But you know, Democrats, their reign broke during the Bush years as well, and rightfully so. That was a much more destructive presidency. But Donald Trump, like in 10 years, they're going to normalize him when we get President Tom Cotton or someone who's even worse. And I think that this fear mongering has not been good for the left. It, it hasn't been good for the center. Because here's the thing, like Joe Biden is, I think, better than Donald Trump, albeit marginally. But if we are able to defeat Donald Trump, all of the bad policies that come along with Trumpism aren't just going to vanish into thin air. Sure, we we don't have war with Iran if Joe Biden is president, most likely. But that doesn't mean it's done forever. We postpone it four to eight years until a Republican gets involved. Maybe the best case scenario, you know, Joe Biden gets to appoint someone to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm not convinced she'd step down if a Democrat was... Uh, able to win the presidency. So it's like we're we're seeing the line between Democrats and Republicans become blurred. And this Tara Reid situation makes matters worse because the one kind of like pull that Democrats had was that they were just better on social issues, women's issues, LGBTQ plus issues, you know, racial justice. And now they're proving that they literally stand for absolutely nothing. So what are we supposed to do? Like, we don't have real choices in this country. And I don't like the talk of just getting a third party like we need fundamental for reform we need five to six parties like we have a lot of ideological diversity in this country even if i'll say voters aren't the most ideological but we need to be able to have like an honest discussion policy wise about what we need to do to fix our country and we're not going to get that with the same two-party duopoly that's been taking place so it you know for me i'm just kind of like reassessing what is going to work? And I think that one of the conclusions that I've come to is that electoral politics is kind of a dead end. I'm not saying that we check out of electoral politics. I think local and state politics is really important, electorally speaking, and we should absolutely support candidates running for Congress. But in terms of just like only eyeing the presidency, I don't think that that's going to make us successful in the long run. I mean, it was nice because we're, we're this close. We're this close to getting the most powerful office in the land, but it didn't work. And nobody else is going to be able to fill that void that Bernie Sanders is leaving. So I, I think the biggest question is, what's next? And there's no answer to that. I, I I totally agree. And, you know, not to be, you know, a downer to the viewers or anything, but, you know, this one dude, he's the one that planted the seed for everything. So, no, and he is far from a deity and he is far from, you know, a god or infallible. But the fact of the matter is, he did plant the seed that brought things like free college, Medicare for all, Green New Deal to the main stage. Nobody this, uh, you know, election year would be talking about any of that shit had Bernie not run in 2016. He also mobilized over a million volunteers. You know, the the uh, what he has inspired in a movement to at least create that groundwork. If we can't do it, I don't fucking know who can. I don't fucking know. Unless someone comes out that none of us have ever heard of, I don't know who else has a 40-year history of activism. I don't know who else has, you know, been fighting for the people that long. Um, I, I feel like if we can't do it with him on the ballot, I, I just kind of don't have hope in that regard at all. It's it's so hard to have hope, right? I mean, I mean, I kind of like, I'll go back and forth. Like, sometimes I'll feel genuinely hopeful and optimistic, but then other times I'll feel like that was stupid, that optimism was pointless, like it's, nothing is going to amount to anything. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, one thing that we have going for us, and I use the word going for us, you know, loosely because it's not a good thing, is that um, all of the material conditions that existed that you know are plaguing the working class they existed before we really knew about bernie sanders as a country 
and they're going to continue to be an issue going forward. So, so long as these issues are there, there is going to be a type of, um, I don't know, there's going to be an opportunity. And it's just a matter of how a movement or a person seizes on that opportunity. And the problem is that it's not necessarily like good actors that can use that opportunity. We see, you know, rising fascism around the world. It's not just in the United States with Donald Trump. You know, he seized on that. He seized on the material conditions in the United States. So it's just a matter of like, who's going to get to it first? Um, and it's a question that I don't know. Like it's, we don't know the end of the story. Not that this story really has an end, but we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Is it going to get better or just progressively worse? And we become acclimated to the shit situation. And I think that all of this uncertainty is what's driving a lot of like the depression and the demoralization because it is tough. Like you want some sense of what the future is going to be. And you can have a loose sense, right? None of us know what's in store for us. Things can change on a dime like that. But, you know, if you can kind of anticipate, all right, well, there's a general way that the wind is blowing. You know, we are we have Bernie Sanders and, you know, we're inching towards progressivism. You know, the younger generation, you know, anyone who's under 45, basically, is very progressive. So that's what we have in store for us. I think that that's something to hang on to possibly. But then I also tell myself conditions can change. Um, you know, it, I don't think it's as easy as some people are saying that we just wait for the boomers to die. Not that, you know, we love boomers. There's a lot of great boomers in the Bernie movement, but it's not so easy as waiting for the next generation to die off because people's opinions change over time. And someone who supports Bernie today, 10 years from now, could be uh, you know, duped by some different ideology. You know, people aren't as consistent and principled as we, as I would have liked to thought, uh, to have thought they were. And this election is definitely showing that with the Tara Reid stuff. I mean, I believe Democrats when they came out against Brett Kavanaugh swinging, you know, with because I believe Christine Blasey Ford. And I thought, well, you know, it's great that we at least have allies in power who are looking out for women, at least, you know, rhetorically, at least when it comes to, you know, these issues. And now it's mask off for everyone. Nobody cares. Everyone just wants power. And I don't know how to process that. And I think a lot of people don't know how to process that. And I don't know what to do with that information. I don't know how to work within the confines of that very disgusting system. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things I'm looking forward to is, you know, I protested at Occupy DNC at the convention in 2016, six days marching like eight miles a day and over a hundred degrees. I mean, it was insane. Um, but I couldn't have gone through that week were it not for my brothers and sisters with me. Um, so I will be doing that again. I already have my, my place booked in Milwaukee, so I'll be flying out from Pennsylvania. Um, it is, according to Tom Perez, not that I trust him, but he said in his squeaky, annoying voice that it's still going on. He said that a few days ago. Um, so if it's still going on, I am there, I am in the streets, I'll be filming. If it does go, uh, become virtual and it's canceled, I am organizing with one other person, a protest in DC at the DNC headquarters. Either way, they're going to fucking hear me. Like yeah. either way, I will be there and I will have other comrades, whoever wants to come. Um, they're going to listen, period. Um, what will it do? I don't know, but it fucking felt good when I did it before. I mean, at least uh, selfishly, I don't know, but at least it felt good. Like it felt like I'm, you know, saying like, fuck you, like, um, you know, and, and look at the dem exit numbers. Like you did this yourself. Tough shit. Yeah, they're hemorrhaging support and that will continue. And maybe, you know, Joe Biden can squeak by and win, but that's not going to change the underlying issues with the Democratic Party. And I will say one good thing that we can take away from this election um, and just Bernie Sanders, that phenomenon in general, even if it's over, I think, and this is corny, one of the greatest gifts that he gave us was each other. We like we've made so many great friends, you know, throughout this process. Um, you know, there's so many people that I know personally, like my mom, who was awakened politically for the first time. Um, and this is this is so special like that there's real value in that so it's not like all of this was done for nothing i don't want people to take that away all of the effort that we did make to get bernie elected we don't know how that's going to pay off 
But even if, you know, in your life, you just convinced one extra person, that is huge. That is huge because it takes all of us at an individual level to, you know, have an effect on the on the macro level, you know. Um, so that's what I will say. Um, is there anything before we get to your special announcement that you wanted to talk about? Because we could basically talk for days and um, not run out of things to say. But is there anything that you kind of had that you wanted to bring up on cam? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I have a lot of great shows coming up. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think we we talked on much of it. I, you know, when I post these things about Bernie people, some people get very defensive. And, yeah. you know, I have, to, I have to clarify a lot. Look, I love him. I will always love him. But he's pissing me off. Like, yeah. it's that simple. Um, and I took uh, the Bernie poster down that I've had every show for three years. Um, because I, I just I, I don't maybe it'll go back up one day. I don't know. But, you know, my audience was kind of upset, you know, that I did. And I'm like, look, I, I'm going through grieving period here. <laughs> like, I, when I look at that, I see pain right now. Yeah. I don't need to look at it. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people are grieving a different way. Um, I'm glad I got to vote today, but it's still kind of, you know, sore. Um, but, and I think we're all dealing with that, you know, despair and depression and hopelessness, um, in our own way. And I'm just looking forward to being an activist again, because you can't be one right now, unfortunately, like armchair activism is not my thing. I want to get back out like on the Capitol steps and stuff like that. Um, so the, the forced agoraphobia is not really my thing. I'm looking forward to just, you know, getting back out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that. Um, and as someone with actual agoraphobia, like I literally have agoraphobia. Um, this is even too much for me. Right. Because <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Aww. I have agoraphobia. I've made some progress over the course of the last um, couple of years. But I mean, with anything, you kind of backslide. Um, but, you know, this is even like a bit much to me because there is like a greater sense of like being confined. And even though that that's comforting to me in a way, it's still really uneasy. Right. Because if I want to go, um, you know, get a bean and cheese burrito from Taco Bell, um, I don't want to have to like get on the mask, get hand sanitizer. Like it's just it's a lot. It's a lot. And th that's like totally a first world problem. Right. I could be way worse off. But, you know, it's it is a scary time in general. You know, my best friend, she has COVID. You know, she's a healthcare worker. My niece is in healthcare and I'm terribly worried about her. So I just want everyone to be able to move past COVID. And I think that once we do get past this and we will get past this, I think then we can kind of figure out what to do next. And I will say to people who are feeling depressed, because it's certainly not just us. You know, there's nothing that we can say that is going to make you feel better, but hopefully it's comforting to know that you're not experiencing this alone. There's a lot of people online who need people to talk to, who, you know, will text with you and call with you. Um, and even if that doesn't necessarily seem like it's something you want, trust me, it does really help. Just talking to someone about things, it's important. Like, see, one of the things that irritates me is, you know, whenever these types of issues pop up and we discuss mental health nationally, you know, as a country, it's always, oh, seek help, get a therapist. A lot of people don't have money for that or insurance. Um, so we have to make do with what we, uh, what we've got. And, you know, talking to people with the same types of issues who are going through the same thing, a lot of us are experiencing this right now. Um, it really does help. So I will, uh, I will leave people with that. Um, we don't want any, anyone to come away, you know, feeling like there's no hope. It feels like that now, but there have been times where we felt like this before and we felt hopeful again, like the world keeps turning, you know, the sun will rise again, but right now it's all darkness um, and it sucks. It seems like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but I genuinely believe, as I said to my core, I am an optimist. I believe things will get better. Um, and that's deep within, like you have to like really dig to find that belief in me, but I know it's there. I know it's there and I know that things will get better. It's not going to be perfect. We're not going to live in a utopia, but you know, uh, better than now. Um, because how could it possibly, you know, um, well, I shouldn't say how could it get worse? Um, but yeah, I think things are good. I'm not going to jinx it. Knock on wood. But <laughs> I think, you know, the thing.
thing is, like, I, I, you know, I get so down sometimes, and then I think, you know, it's kind of trite, but, like, at the end of the day, I do not want Nira Tandon and Alyssa Milano giving each other cheers with mimosas that I'm crying in the corner. <laughs> so, fuck that. Like, they're not going to see me, like, continually, like, down. Because yes. that's what they want, and it's trite, but it's freaking true. They relish in us being sad. Oh, Bernie draw. They don't get it. It's, it's not, you know, in their conceptually, they're just too immature, but, um, so fuck it, you know, yeah, we'll be down and out. We're allowed to be down, but get back up. Exactly. If anything, be more annoying, be a bigger thorn in the sides of the establishment. Give these fuckers hell because they've given it to us. And yeah, I, I think that's such a great thing to point out. Like, don't be down because that's exactly what they want. And they've won. But I mean, the fact that we almost won is kind of astonishing because this is like a grassroots movement. And we took on a capitalist machine, like a global capitalist leader. Like, that's kind of fucking insane if you think about what we went up against. And we almost won, right? We didn't, but it's still remarkable um, so there is a there there. We just got to harness it and uh, try to move on. Um, so I will say that you have a very special announcement um, about the next project that you're working on. I got spoilers and I love it. I'm so excited. Take it away, Joy. I had to tell someone like I anyone who watches my show knows like I don't keep things and I don't really. But so when people come to me and they're like, yo breaking but you can't tell anyone i'm like ah. uh, so I'm yeah like, <laughs> so i've been working on this for like almost a month and i'm like gonna explode but um so myself and peter douche slash nate sliver slash pat the burner pat coat um all one person uh <laughs> and i are writing his next um our next parody um which is on the resistance um trademark so <laughs> it's all about karenisms and you know just the hypocrisy and we hate bernie bros um and all of those things and we are just having so much fun writing it um we have given ourselves a due date of june 30th um and we will be doing pre-orders sometime around there um and w the reason we're trying to write it so quickly well first of all the you know the resistors are on Twitter kind of helping us write it themselves, to be quite honest. Yep. Um, but the reason we <laughs> we set that date um, for next month is because we hope to have them edited and printed by the time we go to convention so we can, you know, sign them for people and, and stuff there. Um, Pat's last book, the Peter Douche book, um, was a huge success. So, um, one day I was like, I'm so fucking depressed. Write a book with me. And he's like, really? I was like, yes. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I was like, yay. So we've just been having a blast with it. And and I'm so happy that I finally got to uh, say something because I haven't even told my organization that my show is on. Like literally really? nobody knows except my husband and you and Peter Douche. <laughs> like, that's, that's incredible. Um, <laughs> but I will say that um, all of our favorite characters are going to be in it. All of our favorite shit libs um, make at least a small appearance. Um, and uh, and all I'll say is um, some of our favorite burners will make an appearance too. Nice. So it, it's, it's geared to make people laugh and it's actually making us laugh while we're writing it. So... I think it'll be kind of cathartic for people to be like, oh my God, I saw people say that. It's so hilarious. Like, and just kind of, you know, if we don't laugh, we'll cry. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm excited for people to read it. I think it'll be really great. I am so excited. Um, And like, I got a little bit of, you know, um, background information about some of the shit lib characters. You guys are going to die laughing. Um, And just the fact that you mentioned the Karenisms will be included in the book. Uh, I feel like we need this right now, so <laughs> I'm yeah, looking it, forward it, to it. What gave me the idea is is watching the disgusting responses from women about Tari. I was like, I I can't even. I gotta like do something 
like poetically or or something like this to to just let me escape from this because I'm it is so egregious and then I was like let's just take you know make Alyssa Milano and and such is already a parody essentially (laughs) so you know let's just do something with that and then also you know last year I lost over 70 percent of my eyesight so this is a you know, and I, and I was an English major. So this is, you know, I haven't been able to really write. So this has been very, um, very good for me. Um, That's so awesome. Kind of so that I can, I can still do what I love to do. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. And it's not just like helping you like this is something that I think a lot of people are going to love. Like we need to laugh. Like you said, like, if we don't laugh, then we're gonna cry. So we need to laugh. Um, I just I okay, I gotta press you a little bit. Um, And you don't have to say this because I don't want to spoil it. But Alyssa Milano's character, can we get any background? on uh, on that any name for her i'm not gonna give her name but um let's just say uh we are kind of going through tweets to kind of <laughs> you know i mean there's no way you're not gonna know who these characters are yeah yeah let's just put it that way like you're if you're on twitter you know who these people are oh yeah period. there's gonna be no discussion yeah <laughs> it... just hoping we don't get sued <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> i'm like what is the legality of this because uh fair use fair use you know, i've had to be very very like um uh, i had to do a lot of research about fair use and that is that's all parody that's fair game so they can't touch you. and if they try uh they're in the wrong um but it, yeah, it, I mean, we're only saying what they said so if they find it offensive they need to be self-critical because we're just literally saying what they said themselves said yeah stop being such a self-parody if you don't want to be in a literal parody book like maybe maybe that you know um (laughs) i'm looking forward to it they don't turn around and write one about me they'll be like she talks like a valley girl and you know (laughs) all the shit will come out i'm like but you know fair game i guess Uh, hey they're not they're not artistic enough to do something like that these are shills these are corporate ghouls they don't care so We've got to make fun of them because that's all we got. That's the that's the best that we can do to make ourselves feel better. And anyone who is like very online on Twitter, I already know that they're going to love this based on what you've told me behind the scenes. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll bring you and Pat the Burner back on to talk about this when it releases. Always got to support, you know, progressive projects. I'm looking forward to this. Joy, tell the people what we can do to watch your show and where to find you online. Um, So uh, you can find me on Twitter at at Savage Joy Marie One. Um, and that's good to follow me for all my upcoming shows. Um, and also for updates on the book and, you know, a link to pre order. Um, also, you can follow my shows and see about 300 back episodes on Real Progress in Action on um, YouTube. We just became a 501c3. Um, so we had to change the name to kind of, um, you know, become that 501c3 and keep politics separate from our economic side. Um, So yeah, follow us on there and check me out on Twitter. And I post a a lot of uh, savage things I'm told. So yeah, yeah. the name is, uh, I think, representative of uh, your character, Savage Joy. I didn't give it to myself, so I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Joy, it is always a pleasure. We are always happy to have you on the show. Thank you for just like, you know, shooting the breeze and helping to digest what the fuck just happened over the last two years. (laughs) Yeah, so we'll have to watch this back and be like, I don't know, we were kind of off or whoa, we were psychic. Like, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I've, I've had, you know, both of those reactions to myself. Like, wow, I nailed it or... Oh, I was wrong. So we'll see. It'll yeah. be interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I love you. I adore you to pieces. Oh, same, same. Absolutely. It's always fun to talk shit with you. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Howie Hawkins. He is the co-founder of the National Green Party in the United States, and he's currently seeking the nomination of the Green Party. He just announced that his running mate will be Angela Walker, and there's a lot happening with his campaign. Howie, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thanks for having me. Is it okay if I call you Howie? Everybody does. Okay, okay, that's easy. It's uh, 
The only primary I lost in the Green Party primary is somebody put Howard on the ballot. <laughs> and that reminded I got only time I got Kyle Howard is when I was in when I was a kid. So everybody calls me Howard. That's fine. Yeah. See, I, I same is kind of true for me. I go by Mike. Um, and when people call me Michael, like online and whatnot, like my, my family calls me Michael, but when I see someone online call me Michael, it, fe it feels really weird. So it's like, don't, don't do that. So I thought I'd ask beforehand. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the program. Um, it's not often that we get a presidential contender on, but I, I just kind of wanted you to be able to explain what your campaign is about because my audience, if, if you're not aware or familiar with them, um, they are largely supportive of Bernie Sanders or were. And judging from the response that I've seen, there's a lot of people that feel very disappointed, very demoralized. And I've seen, you know, a sentiment that, you know, many of them want to check out of electoral politics altogether. So what is your message to these individuals who feel like all hope is lost? There's nothing we can do. What do you say to these types of people? Well, I think Bernie showed there's a lot of support for the progressive reforms he talked about. And some people say he created that. I think he just gave voice to a lot of sentiment that was already there, like Medicare for all. You can check the polling. They used to call it national health insurance, going back to Truman. And it's always polled more favorably than those opposed, usually in a substantial majority, occasionally a plurality. So he gave voice and particularly at a time when, you know, healthcare is becoming harder and harder to access. And the same thing with inequality. We've had 45 years of stagnant wages, housing and healthcare and college for the kids have gone through the roof. And so people are retiring with no savings. Some of them are still paying student loans. I know a woman who comes out of the civil rights movement, named Coley Clark, she was Medgar Evers' assistant, active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went north with King to Chicago. She finally got into college in the 80s. She's on Social Security now, and they're garnishing her Social Security checks to pay student loans. It's ridiculous. So Bernie expressed what people were feeling. Now, for people to say it's hopeless, it's exactly what the corporate power structure wants, because they don't want to have to pay attention to you. They want to, you know, ignore you if you don't vote. And I would say if you settle for Biden, they can take you for granted. You get lost in the sauce. You vote for Biden, he's against Medicare for all. He said he'd veto it if it crossed his desk as president. So what I'm saying is the Green Party is where you can continue to fight for those things through November and beyond. And so don't waste your vote. You know, make your vote count. Make people hear what you want. And then make the politicians come to you. Yeah. So to the Sanders people, I think we're the logical place where they should go to keep fighting for the things they were fighting for. Yeah, and I think it's so important because when you consider the fact that 100 million Americans basically don't vote, that's really scary. Like that doesn't bode well for the health and longevity, frankly, frankly, of our democracy. So not participating, even though, you know, admittedly myself, I kind of felt like I just want to disengage from electoral politics. That is exactly what the corporate power structure, you know, the capitalist system wants. And so long as you are active and still voting and making your voice heard, I do think that there's hope. But it's when all of us check out, that's when I really feel like, you know, um, then all hope is lost. So I appreciate you saying that. Now, one thing that I have always admired about the Green Party is that they are the closest ideologically to me. So when it comes to you and Bernie Sanders, there is actually some really substantive differences that I appreciate. So first and foremost, one of the major differences is that you are explicitly pro-BDS. On top of that, you support reparations for American descendants of slavery. So talk through a little bit of your policy platform. And also, as I understand it, you were the main founder of the Green New Deal. So a lot of the Green Party policies and their platform has been popularized by the progressive left that's fighting within the Democratic Party to an extent. But tell us about your platform and what you're choosing to run on currently. Okay, well... At the broad scale, you know, Bernie calls himself a democratic socialist, and I think he's missing two of the fundamentals of democratic socialism. And this goes back to Marx and Engels summing up the failure of the 1848 revolutions to try to get the franchise for working people. And they were an alliance. These are revolutions spread across Europe and in, into Latin America. And <clears throat> it was the working people and the new middle classes, the professionals, 
in a new rising business class fighting the landed elite to be included in the government. The landed elite made a compromise, let the middle class in, told the working class, you don't get to vote. So Marx and Engels, you know, told the movement, we got to have our own party. We can't rely on the professionals and the business people as reliable allies. So that's one, independent working class political action. The other is Bernie wants to tax the billionaire class in order to fund social programs. Social programs we should have. The problem is the billionaire class still has concentrated economic power. And that translates into concentrated political power. So they can resist and roll back the social programs. So what we got to do is have a socialist economic democracy based on social ownership and democratic administration of the major means of production so that the people, not a capitalist elite, makes the investment decisions and uh, you know has control of the economy. And they have political equality. Democracy needs socialism. Political democracy, you really can't get until you have economic democracy. So that was you know the foundation of the socialist program, a socialist economy. And Bernie, while he makes gestures to it, like he wanted to promote worker co-ops, he talked about public energy in his Green New Deal. But he also said when he gave his speeches on socialism, I'm not about, he called it government ownership. You know, government can be your municipality. I think you want to decentralize as much as possible. Social ownership can also mean cooperative. So, but that aside, you know, he wasn't about changing who owns the major means of production, which is central to the socialist platform. So that's on the broad scale. In terms of the issues I'm raising, I'm leading with what I consider three life or death issues. The climate crisis, which is where the Green New Deal comes in. The inequality crisis. Inequality kills. Working class life expectancies are declining. So we call for an economic bill of rights. And we can talk about how these different programs would work, but the right to a job, an income above poverty, affordable housing, comprehensive health care, public education from pre-kindergarten, child care through post-secondary, colleges, universities, technical and trade schools, continuing adult education, and finally, a secure retirement. And I want to double Social Security benefits to do that. So that's a life or death issue because for basically the bottom half of the income spectrum, every month it's like, if you have to go to the doctor, it's a crisis. You have to skip rent or utility payments and put you in trouble. Or you skip the doctor's appointment and you might die. A man, the man that lived downstairs from me last year, he had to get kidney medicine. He's on Medicaid. The Medicaid didn't pay for the kidney medicine. And when it came to the end of winter, March, he decided to pay his utility bill and skip the medicine that month. His kidneys failed by mid-April. That kind of thing happens too often. So that's the second life or death issue. The third is this new nuclear arms race. We're modernizing our nuclear forces. The strategic nukes are six times faster. Launch on warning isn't the issue anymore. You launch when you think the other side might launch. So the hair triggers closer than ever. We got tactical nukes in, conven uh, in conventional forces <clears throat> with the military doctrine that we can escalate the de-escalate. So if you're losing a conventional war, you use tactical nukes, and then you say, well, de-escalate. De Russians have the same doctrine. That's insanity. I mean, Daniel Ellsberg's last book was The Doomsday Machine. And the point was that, and he used to be a nuclear war planner before he was a Vietnam war planner. He said, once the nukes start flying, it's basically automated. They're all going and we're dead. So we need to, and, and this is a you know major part of my program, deep cuts in military spending. I'm saying 75%. Get out of these seven official wars we're involved in. Get out of special operations in over 100 countries. Start bringing our troops home <clears throat> and then take some nuclear disarmament initiatives. Pledge no first use. Disarm to a minimum credible deterrent. And on the basis of all those tension reducing initiatives, go to the nuclear powers and say, we want complete and mutual nuclear disarmament. According to a treaty that was agreed to by 122 nations in July 2017, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And hardly anybody in this country knows about it because none of the presidential can candidates in any party are really talking about this issue, let alone having putting forward proposals for disarmament. 
So those are my three leading issues. They're life or death issues. And then the fourth one that always comes up is, well, you're going to spoil the election for Biden. You know, no, the Democrats are spoiling the election because since Nader ran, we've been promoting a proven nonpartisan solution, which is get rid of the Electoral College and go to a ranked choice national popular vote. Then you can vote for what you want without helping your worst enemy. And the Democrats have never picked that up. Instead, they blame the Russians and the Green Party. And that's not dealing with reality. So these are things that we're trying to raise. And then you, you mentioned a couple issues, um, reparations and BDS. Well, start with BDS. I'm generally against economic sanctions. They hurt the people more than they hurt the people you're trying to target. And right now, in this coronavirus thing, a lot of these countries were sanctioning need aid and trade to deal with the coronavirus crisis. And they were having problems before this. Um, the exception is when an oppressed people asks for that kind of support. And I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement, seeking divestment and U.S. sanctions against South Africa, which we finally got in 86. I was very involved from the Soweto uprising in 76 until Congress over overrode Reagan's veto of sanctions. And that very quickly got the South African elite to say, you know, we can continue to exploit and oppress Africans here, or we can do business with the rest of the world. And they chose business. And although South Africa is still a very unequal society, they don't have the formal racial barriers. So that worked. And we got the same kind of situation in Israel, Palestine. And the Palestinian movement's very united around boycott, divestment, sanctions. So I support them. And the way I would apply it is in steps. So you don't just shoot all your bullets in one blast. And the first thing which the movement there is calling for, the National BDS Committee, uh, Omar, Mar Omar Barghouti is the prominent leader there, is, is military sanctions. We should start cutting military aid to Israel until they start respecting Palestinian human rights and negotiate in good faith for a resolution. Instead, we got the Trump administration about to approve, you know, give their, you know, house of, uh, what do you call it, stamp of approval on... Uh, Netanyahu annexing the settlements in the West Bank, which is exactly the opposite of where we go. The U.S. cannot, you know, basically have a position, Israel, right or wrong. It should be neutral. They should be for the human rights of everybody living there. And BDS, I think, can contribute to that. As far as reparations goes, absolutely. The next step is a commission to study reparations for African Americans. I think we need to study it and have this commission because African-American community needs to be heard from in terms of what they need from reparations. There's always been a debate how much it should be individual and how much should be collective. In other words, African-American families have on average one-tenth the wealth of white families. They need, you know, some money to make, you know, repair the damage that's been done by slavery, Jim Crow, ongoing discrimination. And, you know, people say, well, that's a long time ago. Well, what about during the Obama administration, black America lost half its wealth because the corporate criminals that did predatory lending and foreclosures and then the, the robo signing, which was just basically computerized fraud to steal people's homes, uh, they were not prosecuted. In fact, two of them are in the Trump administration now, Steve Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross. And they were right in the middle of the robo signing. Mnuchin and One West was notorious predatory lender and forecloser. So, that happened in the last decade. So this is, you know, something that needs to be repaired right now. But these are the things that need to be studied. The collective side is if you give people cash in an economy that still has institutionalized racism and capitalist exploitation, the capitalists are going to end up with that money when people spend it. So how do we change the system? When the modern reparation movement started, James Foreman, who came out of SNCC, and they had a black economic development conference in Detroit, and he came up with the Black Manifesto, and he took it to the Riverside Church in the manner that the churches and synagogues fund black newspapers, TV stations, and radio stations, and a black research institute as institutions that would help the black community come to grasp with their situation and, and advance, you know, educate people through the media and advance policy solutions. So those are the kinds of things the commission would study. And uh, I would add that there are other groups that need reparations. 
There are Mexican Americans in New Mexico whose land has been lost against the Treaty of Hidalgo Guadalupe, which was what settled the War of 1848 when the U.S. basically took half of Mexico. And those people had land rights that had been violated. And of course, uh, Indian treaty rights. There's 370 treaties with indigenous people. Lands has been stolen against those treaties and services that the federal government is supposed to provide have not been. So there needs to be an honoring of those Indian treaty rights and bringing those services and that land back into their possession. So, and then the other people are, and this overlaps with the black community and the brown community is the war on drugs, the devastation it did to communities. We need a truth, ju truth, justice and reconciliation commission. So people can talk about what happened to their communities and what needs to be done to repair them. Because, you know, all the people put in prison for possessing drugs, that's most of what the people that went to prison, uh, you know, destroyed families, uh, evacuated large portions of communities of young males, and it was devastating. So that's another area where we need reparations. Yeah, and I, everything that you say, I agree with 100%, which is really, you know, it, it's nice because when we we talk about politicians in any of the two major parties, even if you find agreement, you're going to find vigorous, like, disagreement in other areas. Whereas with the Green Party, your policies mostly line up with myself ideologically. But one of the most important things that I really respect the Green Party for is your relentless advocacy for ranked choice voting. Because this isn't, to me, just about voting, you know, for who is someone I agree with. Like, I genuinely want power structures to be infiltrated by outsiders like the Green Party and whatnot. So can you talk through about what ranked choice voting nationally would look like and how we would get that? Because we know that in the state of Maine, uh, this was approved via ballot initiative, and now we see a relatively competitive race with a third party candidate, a Green Party candidate, Lisa Savage. So if we got ranked choice voting, um, we're not necessarily just talking about a third party in terms of the Green Party. We're talking about a huge step forward in terms of a multi-party system. One, why do you think Democrats refuse to adopt this? And I think we both know the answer, but I, you know, I think it's cathartic to hear, you know, why from you. And also, two, how do you think, as you know, a collective left, Greens, socialists, independents, we can make ranked choice voting a reality? Well, I think the Dems are worried that a third party will get established. Their instinct with the Greens is to keep us off the ballot. You know, I'll just talk about our experience in New York. We have to get a substantial petition done before we had a ballot line, and they always challenged us. And even when we did have a ballot line, like this year, the DNC with that uh, national firm, law firm that worked for Clinton and the DNC, one of the partners is named Coe, forget the other name, prominent law, Washington law firm, went to court and said, as the coronavirus lockdown started, um, we're challenging the green signatures and the green signatures were good. You know, we went to enroll greens and they were good uh, petitions and said, we're challenging them, but we don't want the board of election to review them because of the coronavirus crisis for public health reasons. Therefore, knock the greens off the ballot. And we defeated them on that, but that was their instinct. And then under the cover of the coronavirus crisis, the state budget attached to it, uh, tripling the ballot access requirements for the Green Party to keep our ballot in terms of votes in this election. And if we don't get it, uh, tripling the number of signatures we got to get from 15,000 to 45,000 in a six-week window. And when you're petitioning, you really need double. So 90,000 signatures in a six-week window. You know, we do it with volunteers. Um, the Democrats, they got a lot of money. They could pay people to do that. But that's a real barrier. So the New York Times, when they heard about this plan, they called it the Democrats' secret plan to kill third parties. So that's why the Democrats, they don't want a democracy. They want to take the left for granted. And so I think that's what motivates them. Uh, but there are progressive Democrats who've got behind it. We have ranked choice voting in about 20 cities. They passed it in Maine, the, the, the Democrats, progressive Democrats up there, as well as libertarians and you know, just sort of those practical Democrats and Republicans you have up there in New England, town meeting country, where, you know, those elected officials in the state legislature, they, they sort of have to be accountable to those town meetings because those town meetings can, you know, call them to task too. So different kind of political culture than most of the country. So I think that helped. Um, so, 
yeah, ranked choice voting, you know, people should understand it. You rank your choices, one, two, three. Take the Nader, uh, Florida thing. Just to, so There were a lot of candidates, but just have Nader, Bush, and Gore. The, more of Nader's supporters, second choice would have been Gore over Bush. So what happens in ranked choice voting, if nobody gets the majority in the first round, the last place candidate's eliminated, and their ballots switch to their second choice. So in that election, Nader's vote would have switched to Gore, and he would have won handily. Um, so that eliminates the spoiler problem, the incentive to vote for the lesser evil to stop your worst enemy. Um, the other thing ranked choice voting can do is get proportional registration, re proportional representation in legislatures. It's called the single transferable vote. So the counting is a little more complicated. It's the same principle, but, and there are bills in Congress for this. You have multi-member districts and you rank your choices in order of preference. And the end result is each party gets representation in proportion to the support they got. So that's in contrast to the plurality winner system we have right now. So I, I ran in this district where I'm sitting right now about nine years ago now, and I got 48 percent of the vote. And the person that got 52 percent got all the power. My vote didn't get any representation. And that leads to tyrannies of majorities or sometimes tyrannies of minorities because the plurality wins. And that's that's not right. This is a system of, of uh, voting, plurality winner, that was invented in the late Middle Ages in England in 1430. They made the sheriff, instead of taking what he thought was the consensus of all the property owners in his shire, he had to go out and actually count them. And the plurality uh, candidate would then go to the House of Commons. You know, we're, what are we now? Six, almost 600 years later. It's time for a, an update. Yeah, the system, the system is antiquated. And to kind of put this into context for people, when we talk about multi-member districts, the districts that we're all in, we get one representative, right? So the person with the plurality, if they get 45% of the vote, that they win, right? The 65% gets no representation. So if we just increased the district magnitude to two, in that instance, in your race, you as well as your opponent would have gone to Congress. And let's say, hypothetically speaking, you know, we had someone with 45%, someone with 30%, and someone with 10%. It, the people, like the majority of people, would have someone representing them, representing their voice, whereas the 10% would be left out if the district magnitude were two, for example. But it just it makes things more representative. It's more proportional and it's more democratic. And so I totally agree. And this is why I've really been trying to push ranked choice voting for so long, because it helps to make marginalized voices electorally actually um, take positions of power, which is important. Now, speaking of, you know, being disenfranchised as a non-mainstream candidate, you were recently suspended from Twitter. You got your account back. And this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. You know, third party candidates, uh, you know, activists, social media does tend to marginalize them to a degree. Indie media on YouTube kind of is doing the same thing to us currently. So can you talk a little bit about what was that all about? Because I heard that you were banned from Twitter. I thought it was outrageous. Um, but you're back. But what, what happened? Well, they said I was impersonating myself. <laughs> I, you know, how do you do that? And, you know, it was just a two or three sentence message. They didn't talk to me. Didn't I think what happened is somebody, you know, there's a complaint form. They said somebody complained saying they were me that somebody that my page was impersonating them. And without investigating, they just took me off. So we got some media and there was a petition and so then we got a two sentence uh, you know letter about maybe a week or 10 days later and they said uh, your uh, pages or what do they call it restored it'll be up in an hour and then it just said thanks Twitter they always sign off thanks Twitter they never talked to me so it's still kind of a mystery what happened um, but my guess is somebody you know, played a dirty trick on me and then Twitter just didn't investigate and just took that complaint form at its face value. And even if it wasn't necessarily someone reporting you, it could have been automated. But just to kind of compare contrast, could you imagine this happening to any sitting member of uh, Congress, a Democrat, a Republican? It only happens to the outside voices who conveniently 
kind of, you know, uh, need to be suppressed for the powers that be. So, you know, uh, we can put on our tinfoil hats and speculate about this, but I thought that it was it was absurd to have, you know, a presidential candidate be suspended from Twitter for an arbitrary reason. Nonetheless, I had to ask you about that since I had you on. Uh, another thing that I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about is we've been hearing a lot about the prospect of Jesse Ventura jumping in the race, possibly seeking the Green Party's nomination. Now, I wanted to ask you because the Green Party's nomination is still taking place. There's other candidates running. There's Dario Hunter. There's others. Um, how would this work? I mean, assuming he wants to run for green, assuming he's going to run for president, is there any way that you and him could collaborate? Would he have to run as a separate candidate? What are your thoughts on this? Well, he has said he's supporting the Green Party this year. He joined the Green Party. Uh, it remains to be seen if he's actually going to run. You know, I think Jesse's a guy that likes to win. He's getting in late. You know, the numbers just aren't there. Um, and, you know, he has a, a mixed history on policy that, you know, the Greens are going to scrutinize. So he'd have a tough time, I believe. Um, and, you know, it remains to be seen if he actually gets in. Um, but I welcome him getting involved. And, uh, you know, if, he, if he's not running, I'll, you know, ask for his support. He said he'd support the Green Party. And, you know, politics is about addition, not subtraction. So if he brings in people, that's good. Sure, sure. Um, I, this was before we got news that you announced your VP. Um, but in the event you hadn't selected a VP, would that be a possibility of selecting Jesse Ventura? Um, do you know if any of your opponents would have considered that? Just because I think that name recognition is a real struggle for third party candidates. So I could see value there. But I mean, you would want ideological consistency, of course, something to consider. But is that something that you would have considered if he had made this, you know, um, not announcement, but, you know, uh, floating of a candidacy sooner? Well, I chose Angela Walker because I know her. I have a rapport with her. You know, that personal chemistry is so important when you're running as a team. She knows the issues. She speaks in a way that people understand and believe her conviction. She moves people. Um, she's a younger African-American worker. She's a truck driver with a long history. She ran against David Clark, that crazy sheriff in Milwaukee County, wears the cowboy hat. Yeah, He was a Trumpy. I mean, he was... After Angela ran against him, she got 20 percent of the vote. She ran as an independent socialist back in 2014. Uh, people started dying in his jails. He was telling people to get a gun. Don't call 911. I mean, it was really somebody who had to be challenged. And, you know, Angela is that kind of person. She stepped up and uh, she's been involved. She was involved in the Wisconsin uprising as the legislative director of her amalgamated transit workers union uh, local. She was a bus driver at the time in Milwaukee. Uh, so, you know, when we talked in my campaign team, she was always at the top of the list as far as I was concerned. So I was just happy that she agreed. Um, I've never met Jesse Venture. I mean, it would take time to develop a relationship. Um, I think she balances the ticket in so many ways that I, I don't think I could have a better choice. Uh, but if, you know, Jesse doesn't run but supports us, you know, there's a role for surrogates. He can speak to his people and urge them to vote for us. Uh, and, you know, I, I would welcome that. And I respect that um, because, you know, I don't I was a little bit torn on this. Right. Because I think that name recognition is really important. But at the same time, I, I like Angela Walker. I like her. Uh, the, the fact that she's a working American. I like that she's an activist. So I do think you have to find that balance. And I thought that you made a fantastic choice. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to get your take on this because. I wasn't necessarily sure what was going to happen if anything would come of that because I knew that back in 2016, and I think earlier on, you and Jill Stein had kind of been open to working with Bernie Sanders, so I wasn't necessarily sure if that was something that w would have been possible. Um, so yeah, thank you for speaking on that. You know, I don't know that he will run, but if he is trying to, you know, um, spread policies that are positive for working Americans, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll support that. But yeah, I respect your decision. I think that, you know, the logic makes a lot of sense. You want people who are organizers, who are activists and who are working Americans, because, I, I you know, the when I think of idealism in America and the American dream, there's nothing more American than a truck driver, you know, running for president to be on a ticket. I, I think that's great. 
Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so moving on, I do want to ask you a question. This is a little bit of a controversy. So in an interview with Primo Nutmeg, you had misgendered and dead named Chelsea Manning. And just for context, um, I want to read the quote to you. You, says, you say this about Julian Assange. Julian Assange should not be prosecuted for publishing leaks from Bradley Manning or what what's he call himself, Chelsea. Um, so I just want to get your take on that. I don't believe that this is something that you did intentionally, but dead naming is something that's really harmful to the trans community. And I, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of respond to that. Yeah, I put my foot in my mouth. Um, this was like 70 minutes into a long interview when I got up in three, at three in the morning to drive over to Massachusetts to give a speech and then did this interview. And I was worried about lunch. I was afraid I was going to miss it. And so, you know, I've worked on the uh, Manning case before she transitioned. So that name popped into my head first and I realized, whoops. And then I used the wrong pronoun. It was just an innocent mistake and I've apologized about it, you know, many times. And uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, I, I made a gaffe and I, you know, I apologize for it. It was a mistake. Sure. Thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to get your input on that. This is something that um, my viewers had brought to my attention that I wasn't aware of previously. Um, but thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it, yeah, it's not... I would also add that that was over a year ago. That, it, that I think, it, well, no, I mean, it was May. It was a year ago. But people keep putting it on the internet. Yeah. You know, there's, there are people that oppose me. You know, it, it's kind of a smear thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, please accept my apology. It's sincere. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, another controversy. Um, so you had previously suggested that you believe that the 2016 Democratic Party primary was rigged. I would agree with that sentiment. And now there are other individuals running for the Green Party nomination that are saying that the same thing is virtually happening in the Green Party in 2020. Um, so I want to bring up Ian Schlackman. This is someone who was running for the Green Party nomination, but had previously suspended his campaign. And he announced that he'd be boycotting the nomination for the Green Party altogether because he believes that the process was unfair. It was tilted in your favor. And he puts forward a number of examples. He says that the individuals who were working for the Green Party apparatus as national co-chairs, they didn't step down when they started working for your campaign. So there was a conflict of interest. He also said in an interview with Primo Nutmag uh, that your campaign, the language and verbiage in particular that you put out ended up being adopted by the uh, PCSC, the Presidential Campaign Support Committee. Um, and these rules ultimately ended up disenfranchising other candidates. For example, uh, this led to a vote in uh, North Carolina where, although there were seven other candidates, you were the only one on the ballot. They say that this tried to force a two-way race between you and Dario Hunter. Can you just talk a little bit through this and your response to this? Because I, I think that one of the turnoffs for Democratic Party voters, and I speak only for myself, is the way that the party apparatus uses these types of institutional advantages that they have as leaders of the party to disenfranchise kind of the challengers. So what is your response to this? What is your response to Ian Schlackman and others who are worried about the process itself, who agree with you politically and on the policy, but think that the process wasn't necessarily fair and transparent? Ian is full of it every, in every respect. First of all, I'm not part of the National Party apparatus. I've been grinding away here in Syracuse and in New York State. I haven't been involved in the National Green Party really since we you know, got the current version, the Green Party of the United States, uh, you know, its FEC recognition and so forth and the rules uh, soon after the Nader campaign in 2000. And it actually, I lost a lot of the things I w thought about the way it should be structured. And I think it's ineffective as it's structured now. So I've been focused locally. So to say, you know, I'm pulling strings there, that's just nonsense. Now, the people that work for my campaign, they resigned from the committees. It said my campaign manager, she finished out her term, which was about a month after I announced. Um, now, there are members of the steering committee or the co-chairs. Uh, two of them who publicly support me. Other members publicly support other candidates. <clears throat> One of them, <clears throat> excuse me, supports <clears throat> a candidate, but doesn't say so publicly. It's kind of, you talk about rigging. There's a lot of stuff, games being played, but my campaign's not playing them. 
as far as the rules of the presidential campaign support committee, I had nothing to do with that. I just went by the rules. The rules are, if you want to be recognized by the party, you got to file with the FEC, have a website, fill out a questionnaire, um, raise at least $1,000 from at least 100 people. And uh, there's a fifth criterion. Oh, I think you have to write a letter to the CSC. I mean, it's really simple stuff that if you can't raise $1,000, you shouldn't be running for city council, let alone president. So that was, you know, the thinking was, we get these marginal candidates. Now they're running around saying they're excluded and it's rigged. They don't have campaigns. They just online. And so, you know, it's disappointing, you know, that people do that and it's not constructive. And, you know, I basically ignored it. I haven't spoken out, but you brought up this guy and, you know, what he's writing is just not true. One more thing to follow up him as well as four other Green Party presidential candidates. They did pen an open letter asking for the rules to be re revised to make it more fair um, for more transparency and accountability. Uh, going forward, like I don't necessarily know um, what can be done so far in terms of like 2020. <clears throat> Going forward, how do you think constructively the Green Party can improve the process? Because even if you don't necessarily believe that what Ian Schlackman is saying is correct, the perception for individuals such as myself, it's difficult because for me, I don't necessarily follow the internal politics and factionalization within the Green Party. I'm kind of just an outsider who I support Green Party candidates here, Democrats here. Um, so, I mean, I agree with you on the policy, but I think that transparency and fairness is something that I do care about. So in terms of like just people like me, how, how do you improve this? How do you make the optics better? Well, I think what the PCS try, see, try to do is say we're only going to recognize serious candidates and the criteria are very low, but that didn't stop some people from stepping up. Um, and, you know, in today you can get online and say anything. So I'm not sure I do that. The process is transparent. You mentioned North Carolina. Look, each state party determines who's going to be on their ballot. Some of them go with the recognized candidates. Some of them let all comers on. Uh, California party wanted the three recognized, but the secretary of state put two others on. In North Carolina, they had a criteria and they wanted the candidates to ask the question, how are you going to get on the ballot? And at least they had 37. I don't know why they had 37 states, but that was their number. And none of the other candidates uh, answered that question. You know, we have a ballot access plan to get on all 51 states. Um, and that was the criteria they decided on. So, you know, you got to step up and meet that. I, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable question. You, know, you want to run nationally? How are you going to build a Green Party? Because getting ballot lines is one of the concrete things we can get out of this campaign. In about 40 of the states, the vote we get for president determines whether that state Green Party has a ballot line for the next election cycle. And that makes it a lot easier to run our candidates <clears throat> for local, state, and, and Congress. And in most states, it's a half a percent in New Mexico, one, two, or three percent. A few states is five percent. Alabama's 20 percent. That's the toughest one. But, you know, we can get on the ballot in a lot of states. And, you know, that's how we're going to build this. You know, uh, you talk about name recognition earlier and celebrity. You know, you can't build a party out of that. You mentioned that the people that don't vote, that's working class people, people of color, young people. And even our campaign, we may appeal to them, but that's got to be followed up with organizing, not just mobilizing, get out to vote. Organizing is the kind of thing union and community organizers do. They don't go out and preach to these people. They go out and listen and find out what's going on, how they can help, build relationships, friendships, and trust. And the way we're going to build this party is we got to have Green Party locals in these communities where the people in the community know who the activists are, that they can trust them, that they know what's going on, that they can come to them with issues. And, you know, here in New York, we ran Grandpa Al Lewis, old Grandpa Munster, and got the ballot line in 98. And then we ran celebrities in 2002 and 2006, and we failed to get the 50,000 votes we needed. So in 2010, we couldn't even get any celebrities to step up. So the people turned to me, and I'm a nobody. I was a teamster unloading trucks at UPS during the campaign at night. So, you know, but what we had was a good message, and we had organized it on the ground. And we got our 55, what do we got, 60,000 votes that election. Next election, almost 200,000 votes. 
That's when I got 5%. And, and Governor Cuomo, did I go over that? I've been talking all day to people. But with that 5%, you know, Cuomo had wanted to run up the vote, get more than his father, Mario Cuomo, got, get more than he got in 2010 to get ready to run for president. And he got less. He couldn't take us for granted. That 5%, 200,000 votes, he had to then say, well, what can I do to compete for those votes? And he adopted demands that we were raising and never supported, like a ban on fracking, a $15 minimum wage, paid family leave, and gestures toward tuition-free higher education, which were kind of phony as they panned out. But, you know, he made the move. And that's the kind of influence we can have even without winning the office. So that's why I tell people, you know, vote for what you want and make the politicians come to you. Don't waste your vote on somebody who doesn't believe what you do. Yeah, I wanted to kind of get into that a little bit more as you talk through organizing, mm -hmm. because I think that there's this misconception about the Green Party and that they don't exist until once every four years, they kind of materialize and then dematerialize once the presidential election is over. But that's not actually true. I mean, the Green Party has been consistently fielding candidates at local offices and doing organizing. Uh, for example, I've covered in my program, you know, the activism in the early net neutrality days when Obama was still president of Margaret Flowers. I thought that, you know, her protesting Tom Wheeler was really admirable. So I'm curious in terms of putting aside electoral politics um, for a moment. What do you think is the best way to affect change in terms of organizing? And how big of a role does electoral politics play in emboldening the left? Because I think that that's just one piece of that. And I think a lot of people are kind of reevaluating the role of electoral politics. How big of a role does that play? And is organizing itself actually putting pressure on these existing institutions um, as important or possibly uh, more important as actually, you know, running for office. What is your take on this? Because I know that the Green Party has been incredibly active on non-election years around issues. So, like, can you just talk through, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but for me, I'm kind of thinking through, what do we do as a collective left? And I include everyone in this category, green socialists, anyone who agrees with the policies that I want. How do we uh, at least get the policies we want if we're not able to gain, gain power. Does that kind of make sense? I know it's a little bit broad. Yeah, it's, it's a combination of movement and party. Without the social movements, the party doesn't have the energy behind it. But without the independent party, the social movements get taken for granted by the power structure. Take the Iraq war. I mean, we had such big demonstrations in the U.S. and around the world that the New York Times called us the world's second superpower. But then that movement, unlike the anti-Vietnam War movement, where we were saying out now to McCarthy and Kennedy, who were calling for negotiations, to Humphrey and Nixon. And what we found out was we had such massive demonstrations a year after the election, 69, the Vietnam moratorium in October and the massive demonstrations a month later, that Nixon and Kissinger realized if he went through with his secret plan to end the war, which was to nuke North Vietnam, he wouldn't win re-election. In fact, it might provoke a revolution. They were worried about that because we had so many people in the streets. And we weren't saying we're supporting the lesser evil. You know, against the Iraq war, the broadest coalition, United for Peace and Justice, said their, their slogan was against the Bush agenda, which is saying vote for Kerry, who was pro-war. Kerry was saying, I can fight the war better than Bush. I got a military background. I'm reporting for duty. That's what he said at the convention. And he wanted a bigger surge than Bush eventually got. And that, you know, that really hurt the peace movement. And then when, because the message was the Democrats or the peace party, when Obama got in there and is, you know, having his torture Tuesdays where he's selecting who to kill by drones, escalates in Afghanistan, uh, removes quote unquote combat troops while leaving special operations uh, going on uh, in Iraq and so forth, the peace movement was, you know, largely absent. So, uh, now, that's why the movement is so important, and it's going to be important no matter who wins the presidency in this election. On the other hand, uh, what a party can do for the movements. I mean, our problem in the social movements now is we got this nonprofit industrial complex where if you trace it back, they're billionaires. On the right, it's the Koch brothers. On the left, Soros gets a lot of attention, but there are others, you know, Steyer and Lewis and these other very wealthy people. And... So what happens is you get groups funded, they hire staff, staff sit around a table, decide what the tactics are. And then we get a message on the internet. Move on tells you what the next thing to do is or whoever it is. 
And that's very undemocratic. It's very much like an electoral campaign, top-down mobilization. So people are atomized and easily manipulated because they're not talking to each other and they can't critically evaluate the situation, which happens when you're talking to each other at the grassroots. Now, what a party can do is bring people together and in a multi-issue platform, so you relate the issues and you make allies of people fighting over different issues who may be competing for media attention, supporters, and money. And a party can do that. I mean, in the labor movement, I've, I'm part of, I've gone to these labor notes conferences which promote union democracy. I've been a member of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And they've been going since the you know, 70s. Um, but I don't think it's really going to happen until you have a party with a position on union democracy that it goes in in an organized way and, you know, fights for democracy in the unions. And, uh, you know, all the movements, there are positions that a party could, could bring in there. Because the movements tend to get, you know, patriotic and chauvinistic about their own movement versus the others. Our issues are, we're, we're more oppressed than you are. Our issues more, you know, we got to save the climate, everything else got to wait. No, we got to find a way to bring it all together. And I think that's what a party on the left can do. And uh, so that's why I think that's the missing ingredient for the left, particularly in this country, because we haven't had a party of the working class since the Socialist Party, which came close to becoming a major party. And, you know, we can go into why that didn't happen around World War One. But uh, I think it shows it's possible. But what we got to do is organize, not just mobilize, like I was talking about earlier. That I think, you know, all the left, the movements need to do. You know, we tend to mobilize. We we preach, we go out with our leaflets and our Facebook messages and everything, and we don't take the time to build relationships and get rooted in communities where people trust us. And that's, you know, union organizers know that when they're in a, you know, trying to get recognition or organize a strike or a collective bargaining fight. And community organizers know that, you know, that's how you build a base for your community organization. And it's something that uh, we need to pick up in the other social movements and with the Green Party. Yeah, that's a really thoughtful response. Um, and it kind of puts everything into perspective, uh, given the position of, I think, a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters, because myself, you know, um, I've been politically active since, you know, my college days. But now I kind of feel myself rethinking. I've been introspective lately, wondering what, do, like, how do I get the policies that we need implemented into law? What do I do to affect change? So, I mean, you, you've you been in the trenches for decades. You've been doing this for a long time. So what's the one thing, like the one piece of advice that you could give to a young activist who's just kind of getting involved in politics, you know, is being politically awakened. They just read Marx, Chomsky. What would you say to that person that's the best thing that they can do to affect change? You know, they're maybe thinking, do I run for Congress? Do I organize? Do I join DSA? Do I join Green Party? What would you say to that person? Because I feel like there's so many options that it, it's difficult. And we're, we're all kind of we're experiencing tunnel vision. I think we all just want to get through COVID-19, but we want solutions and we want to we want ha to have some sense of direction. So what do you say to that kind of um, aimless person currently, if you will? Well, Michael Harrington, who I have disagreements with, I mean, he's the the, the grandfather of today's DSA, Democratic Socialist of America, used to say there's no such thing as an unorganized socialist. You got to be part of a group because that sharpens your thinking and it develops you because you got to learn how to speak and, and, you know, represent your thinking and other people challenge you. And, you know, that's one of the reasons of, you know, Green Party locals should be places where we develop people, their education, their ability to speak, write, um, you know, do the kind of graphics, all the things we need to learn how to do. Uh, so you got to be part of a group. And that would be my first piece of advice. Second thing I would say, study history. You want to see how social change happens? See how it has happened. And you'll also learn that most of our movements for progressive change, we lost and we lost and we lost and we lost until we won. And I've been involved in movements where we were a small minority vilified, you know, anti-Vietnam War in 65, 66, 67, you know, we were like, you know, a fifth column for the commies. And then in 68, after Ted, it just flipped. And, and I think in the back of people's minds, particularly those people whose sons and daughters were going off, well, mostly sons, to Vietnam because of the draft and coming back, if not, you know, in a body bag 
or with a wound with mental issues, you know, really scarred, they began to question, you know, why are we fighting Vietnam anyway? And, you know, they be began to realize that there was supposed to be an election in 56 to reunify the country. Or was it? Yeah, 56. And the U.S. didn't want it because they knew Ho Chi Minh would win, who had led the fight against the Japanese occupation and then the French trying to recolonize it and then the Americans. And, and he, you know, his declaration or proclamation of independence was modeled after our declaration of independence. You know, people started like that. But then he flipped. Anti-nuclear movement. When we started occupying the Seabrook nuclear power plant, 8% uh, of the people in New Hampshire agreed with us that nuke shouldn't be built. And we got everybody's attention by that mass occupation, 1,414 of us arrested, put in National Guard armies for 10 days, on the cover of the Newsweekly's Time, Newsweek, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, it went national. Uh, but what we did in New Hampshire is then, that was in the spring, by the next year, we brought town meeting resolutions saying, stop construction works in progress. That's where we had to pay for it before it was up and running, which wasn't a tradition. Plants weren't put in a rate base to establish rates until after they were up and running. And we went to Rock Rib Republican New Hampshire that was, you know, got its news from the Manchester Union leader, very right wing newspaper. And they said, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't pay for this thing if it isn't working. We shouldn't pay for, you know, why does this get special treatment? And they realized the public service company in New Hampshire, this nuke was like, I forget what the ratio was, like 100 times bigger than all the assets they had. It was more a Wall Street project. And, you know, that. so we won that up and down the state. We won those town meeting resolutions. And then they polled again, 80% of the people in New Hampshire were with us. So you start out as a minority. Same thing with the anti-apartheid movement. That was a case where people said, yeah, South African apartheid is terrible, but you're not going to get your college to divest, your union to divest, your city to divest. You're not going to get under Reagan. You're going to get sanctions against South Africa. But we did because in 85, 86, suddenly we got the movement got gained momentum. We put up shanties at Dartmouth College where I had gone. Uh, we prefabbed them, brought them in a flatbed truck, planted them right in the center of the green where they do the bonfires for the football game. It was like sacred territory. And all the liberals who had sort of been intimidated by the right-wing Dartmouth Review, funded by some national right-wingers, they came out of the woodwork. We had 400 people out there within 20 minutes. It just totally changed the climate. And then the other campuses started doing it. And then they, Trans Africa did the it, it, civil disobedience outside the White House. Congress passed a bill that had been in there since the late 60s. Reagan vetoed it. Congress overrode it. So these are cases where we were or fracking in New, in New York. You know, it was the people most affected that were against it, but then people understood what it was. And, you know, we got 5% in 2014, and then Cuomo said, okay, that's what the people wanted. So these are all examples I've lived through where you started out as a minority. But, you know, if you think you're right and you can persuade people, even if it's one-on-one -on -one for a while, you know, keep at it. Because if you study history, you'll find out that you can win. Yeah. So that's so people don't get discouraged. They should have a historical perspective and realize these things, it's like uh, in leaps, you know. It's like you're pushing against the door and suddenly it busts open and you're through. And all the people that were watching you saying, yeah, you're wasting your time, they come running through too saying, we're with you all the time. So that's how it works. And, I, you know, that's what I tell young people. Get in an organization and get in some historical perspective. So when, the, when it's tough going, realize that, you know, you never know when that spark's going to light the prairie fire and, and things will move. Yeah. And I think that that's really great advice, because after speaking to Dr. Harvey J.K., you know, about how radical our history is, you know, on the left and what we've managed to accomplish, you know, we're not necessarily doing anything new today. You know, it's the previous generations, people who have been in the fight like yourself who have kind of like given us a little bit of guidance in terms of what we do. And I think that part of the problem is that all of us, especially myself, we've been hyper focused on electoral politics. And there's this, you know, I think underlying belief maybe that 
we can't really affect change unless we get a progressive president. But when you talk about, you know, uh, sanctions on apartheid South Africa with Reagan as president, it shows people that we have to rethink what we previously thought was possible. And, you know, for me, my, my number one goal is to make sure that regardless of what happens in these elections, people are mobilized and they stay engaged. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of push this off to you now. So speaking to the person again, going back to the beginning of this interview, where, you know, there, there's people considering checking out of electoral politics not voting altogether. Can you make your pitch to those people as to why you think they should stay involved and uh, what we can do to support your campaign? Well, people should stay involved because, you know, our lives depend on it. You know, the climate crisis is not just, you know, more heat waves and some stronger storms. It is mass species extinction, the collapse of ecosystems, the collapse of agriculture. They're climate scientists who've calculated what might happen under a business as usual scenario, and they come out with around 90% of current humanity not being able to be supported by the agriculture we could produce in the year 2100. So this is a real calamity. We talked about the nuclear arms race. And then for, you know, at least the bottom half of the income spectrum, whose average income is $18,500, that's the working poor. You know, it's a life or death issue, you know, if they can sustain a standard of living that's healthy, where they can go to the doctor. So, you know, we got to be engaged just for our own lives. And so, you know, I urge people to be engaged. And, you know, uh, I think they call it Hubert Humphrey, the happy warrior. You know, I try to think about that when, you know, things are not going well. It's like, well, you know, that comes with the territory. And, uh, you know... You should, if you have, if you believe in what you're doing, then you know that should be enough, no matter what people say. And in the long run, you know, you you persuade people, and and these movements can can advance. Um, so that's what I would say to you know people thinking about you know maybe I can't make a difference. Man, you can. You know, a small group of people. I mean, Ralph Nader says if we just had like forget the numbers, like 100 people in each congressional district pestering their member of Congress, we could transform the country because Congress doesn't hear from that many people. Um, you know, organized people can beat organized money. And, you know, while these politicians cater to the money, but when the people, they got to get the votes in the end. And if they're worried about that, that's more important because they want to keep their jobs. And we got power and we have more power than we know. You know, during uh, Vietnam, you know, I mentioned how to, you know, the tactical nuke plan of Kiss that Kissinger and Nixon canceled. We didn't know it at the time. You know, it came out, you know, maybe four or five years later. In fact, Dave Dellinger, one of the leaders of the anti-war movement in that period, wrote a book called More Power Than We Know because we were winning and some of us didn't realize it and we were discouraged. So uh, that's what I would say. Now, to get involved in my campaign, you know, we have a website, HowieHawkins.us. You can get to all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and those other things there. You can read a lot of statements we put out, news releases, op-eds, policy papers, and just statements about what's going on. Uh, you can sign up to volunteer or just get our bulletins about what we're doing. You can donate. Um, we're the only campaign in the country that is seriously going for federal camp primary matching funds. And we're basically at a point now where we expect before the end of this month to qualify. We need $5,000 from 20 states in individual contributions of $250 or less. And we got a chart up there, how we're doing on ballot access. Look at your state. And even if your state is over the finish line with 100%, realize that your donation will be doubled when we qualify, up to $250. And, you know, we need that. We need people working on this campaign. I can't do this all myself. We got to get on the ballot. We just committed $10,000 to the petition in Alaska. In other states, we're going to court in this coronavirus social distancing environment, which makes petitioning unreasonable and saying, hey, you know, the Green Party has been on the ballot several election cycles. Just put us on. And Vermont did that. Illinois said, no, we took them to court and we won in court. And we're, you know, we're doing that. We got 24 ballots, which is equal to 305 electoral votes, which would be enough to win the Electoral College. But we're going for all 51 ballots, all 50 states in the District of Columbia. So, you know, people can help, and that's what we need. We need a little army out there, 
you know, magnifying our voices. If even if it's only in this lockdown, you know, you can't go knocking on doors at this point. Although maybe that'll change. There's, we've been thinking about how to do that with proper social distancing, and uh, maybe as things open up here, uh, that'll become an opportunity. But you can always, you know, use your social media networks, friends, family, neighbors, and talk up the campaign. All right. Well, thank you so much. Howie Hawkins running for the 2020 Green Party nomination. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have you on the program. Hopefully you'll be back to talk about your campaign again when we have an update. I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, folks, that is all that I have on the agenda for today's show. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for not just helping the show to survive, but thrive as well. Um, I understand if you can't support the show because uh, we're all struggling currently, um, but if you can, then um, thank you. But you can also support the show by simply liking our videos, sharing our videos, and just by watching our videos. That honestly goes a long way. Um, so I'm done rambling. I'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Uh, this is The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo.